Today, you are going to learn how to play one whole step higher on the trumpet in one week. Sound unbelievable? This is installment three, or trumpet lesson three in this series on how to play higher in one week. Let me give you this friendly warning. This is not gonna be a tutorial, a trumpet lesson about long tones. Or lip slurs. Yeah, so I'm not going to give you that generic vice that you already know or that you likely have already found on YouTube or that you likely have heard from your trumpet instructor, especially if you're a trumpet major at some college or university. You're not going to get that here. You already know it or it can be easily found on YouTube. Before I continue, please make sure to subscribe to this channel to get amazing and unusual trumpet lesson tutorials. By the way, also lessons for tuba, trombone, cornet, flugelhorn, French horn, baritone, euphonium. Yes, it's all here at Trumpet Sizzle. So subscribe right now and hit that little bell notification so you'll be alerted anytime I put up a new video. So if you've been following along and watching the other trumpet lessons in this series, You'll notice that each trumpet lesson said you could gain a half step in range in one week. But if you listen carefully at the beginning of this video, I told you you could gain an amazing one whole step in one week. You didn't miss here, and I wasn't fooling around. This particular trumpet lesson is going to focus on technique. Yes, a lot of brute strength is required to play skillfully in the upper register on the trumpet or any brass instrument. However, you cannot forget about technique. Technique is essential. Unfortunately, so many people are using the wrong technique to play and excel in the upper register of the trumpet or any brass instrument. Okay, I can hear you say, Kurt, get on with this. What is this amazing technique you keep referring to that will give me one whole step in one week? Okay, you ready for the technique? You ready? Are you ready? The technique I'm going to share with you right now is called lip roll-in. Roll-in. R-O-L-L-I-N. Lip roll-in. And it really amazes me how many people don't know about this and how many people don't do it. And for those who know about it, they still don't do it. I can't tell you how many times I've gone on YouTube to see people start their playing and not roll in. And it looks something like this. The lips are just like this. Your horn comes up like this. And that's it. There's no rolling. So if I'm going to play in the upper register, it's going to go something like this. And what you just heard right now sounded like total crap. Why? No rolling. But you heard at the beginning of this trumpet lesson video, I killed it on Sesame Street. Do you look like this when you play in the upper register of the trumpet? Watch the lips carefully. Let 
let me actually roll in and show you the difference so you can hear it and see it. Want to see it again? Now, let me go ahead and apply that technique of rolling to playing the horn. Remember, this could be applied to tuba, trombone, French horn, baritone, euphonium, cornet, flugelhorn, E flat cornet. I put the mouthpiece up to my lips. If I'm going to play low, I'm going to keep a low C setting, what I call a low C setting. It could be a low B flat setting if you're playing a bass clef instrument. A low C setting. Jaws drop down low. More of a pooch in your lips. Not much roll in. It kind of look, probably looks like that in the mouthpiece. Lips apart, teeth apart. With the roll in, a couple of things have to accompany this particular technique. The jaw needs to be up, not, not down like in the low C. Up, teeth almost touching. Lips up and rolled in. Rolled in. More extreme now. Extremely rolled in. If you can master this technique, you will be able to play one whole step higher in one week. Too good to be true? Again, this is not a trumpet lesson about building strength to gain one half step in one week. It is a technique, and once you learn this technique, your range will go up one whole step. For those of you who are trying to count, that's two half steps in one week. Now here are two strategies that can help you gain this technique. Number one, use a mirror. Yes, you heard right. Practice this technique in front of a mirror. Or maybe you can borrow your mom or sister's makeup mirror. You know the little round one that flips around and one kind of magnifies and you can just set it on something? So use a mirror to see what's going on and try to shadow and mimic exactly what you saw me do in this video. You're going to roll in. Strategy number two, get with a professional trumpet instructor who can show you this technique in person or via Skype. Okay, so did you learn something today? If you did, here's a reminder again to subscribe to this channel. There's a lot of amazing content and actionable material that you can use starting right today. Now I want to turn it over to you. Are you going to use this amazing trumpet lesson technique to skyrocket your range in one week? Well, we're waiting. If you're going to try this technique, could you let us know in the comment section below? And what would really be appreciated would be after one week of trying this technique, how did it go? Let everybody know in the comment section. You're just going to be helping other trumpet players and brass musicians when you do that. Again, leave a comment. This has been Kurt Thompson along with TrumpetSizzle.com. And by the way, if you want amazing tutorials, exercises, practice devices, and practice aids to help make you a better musician, a better brass musician, a better trumpet player, then you need to go to trumpetsizzle.com. And the last word, at the end of this video, you're going to see my top rated trumpet lesson video on the top two reasons why you can't play high at the end of this video. Go ahead and click on it. It's one of the number one rated trumpet lesson videos on YouTube and you watch that video and you'll see why. You're going to learn something. This has been Trumpet Lesson 3, or the third installment in the series on how to play your trumpet higher in one week. By moi, Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one, my friend. On the trumpet in one week. The trumpet technique that I'm going to show you today has really helped me improve my range, actually more than a half step. But we're going to let you guys experience the half step increase in range in high notes on your trumpet by using this one amazing technique.
And thanks to this one amazing technique that I'm going to show you today, I am able to play extremely well in the upper register of the trumpet. Now let me give you this warning. We're not going to be going over the same old, same old that you already know about. Lip slurs. Okay, let me try some high notes here. I'm playing lip slurs. Long tones. Okay. Whew. Okay, now I can play high. Just did a bunch of long tones. You're not going to get that same old advice that you've already been given, long tones and lip slurs. It can only take you so far. You are going to get an amazing, unique technique. I'm Kurt Thompson, TrumpetSizzle.com. Let's dive into it right now. So are you one of those trumpet players that want to play higher? Yeah, me too. You're going to love this technique. I'm going to give you the good, the bad, and maybe the ugly of this technique. It's so simple. You're going to be doing Roy Stevens no pressure system palming. Make your hand like this. Not like this. Not like that. Like this. Give me a high five. Your hand stiff and flat. Now I want you to turn it over. This is my left hand. You're going to turn it over. You're going to make it like a shelf. Almost like a shelf. You know, like you could set something on. See? It's a shelf. You could set a mouthpiece on there. See? Just like a shelf. Take your horn, put it on that shelf. Do not allow your fingers to do this. Even a little bit. Your hands and fingers need to be stiff and straight, almost like popsicle stick. Lay the horn on your hand. Don't grab onto it. Just lay it on like a shelf. If you're not careful, it could actually fall off. That's how you want to do it. It's just like a shell. Here we go. I want you to put it up to your lips. Now, here's parallel. You can have a little angle on it, which will help seal the vibration. This is parallel, approximately. Here's an angle. Put it up where you normally would play and play a little C. Easy, right? Yeah. Step two in how to play harder on your trumpet for this one week technique. On your palm again, and I want you to play two notes. So far, so good, right? Yeah. Seems like we have an echo in this room. Step three. You're going to add a note. So, so far we've done the low C on trumpet. We did the low C to the G on trumpet. Now we're going to add a third note, the C. This has to be slurred and it has to be about mezzo forte to forte, which means medium loud to loud. Remember, hands like a shelf. Lay the trumpet on the shelf. Parallel, you can add an angle to it. You want to play as high as you possibly can. Now, you're going to keep adding notes until you can't play anymore. Let's add a note. Now we'll be going to E. You think you can go up to an E? It's not that hard, is it? Do you think that you can go to an E? It's not that high, right? Yeah. Shelf. Horn. Yeah. 
Did you notice something? Each time I start down on the low C, we went low C, low C, G, low C, G, C, low C, G, C, E. Each time that you repeat it, you always start back on the low C. Getting to that high B flat is going to be quite an advanced move for most of you, but some of you may be able to get it. That was high C doing the Roy Stevens palming no pressure system. If you can get up to high C like that and it was loud, you really have strong chops. You really have strong chops. Yeah. You want a half step increase in your range? Seven days, my friends. Seven. Seven days. Every day. Pretty cool, huh? So now I want to turn it over to you. So did you learn something? Are you actually going to try this technique? Are you actually going to try it for seven days? If so, let me know in the comment section. Love to hear from you. Especially if you tried it for seven days and you got that high range happening. The last word, if you want exclusive tutorials, lessons, and strategies that you can only get here, you gotta go to TrumpetSizzle.com. I have something that's gonna help you get better. Tutorials, lessons, DVDs, practice aids, practice devices, exercises. I'll see you in the next one. go on to some demonstration with some of the other instruments. What if you don't play trumpet? What if you play French horn? So for French horn, I'm going to hold it like this. Let me kind of back up a little bit. I'm going to hold it like this and just, you can see how I'm holding it with my hands, just palming it. All right, let's see what we can do with trombone. Here's your phoneme, and I got one hand down here, and I'm not going to grip it. And um, actually, this is a baritone, and I got the other hand like this, so I'm not gripping anything like that. I'm not able to pull it in, and I'm just going to start um, on a lower note. this guy you're probably going to have to get a little bit more um, innovative with. Um, it's, this is too heavy. What is it like 25 pounds almost just to try to do what I did with the baritone which was pretty light. Um, if you could fashion a way to hang it or with a little bit of rope from some somewhere in your house uh, that would be great. If you have a tuba stand um, I'm going to just maybe try to wing it and do it on my chair. Um, let's just see what happens. Um, so I'm on a chair here now let's just see if I can just work it enough just to show you that this can be done so it's on the chair I got it lean like this and I'm just gonna keep it I'm not I'm not I'm gonna put my hands up here so I'm really not gonna use any pressure Are the wheels turning right now? 
So this would actually be better if you had a tuba stand and you just bring your mouth up to it and don't even touch it. But you could see that I was using no pressure just with the tips of my fingers. If I had to choose one thing to really explode my progress on any brass instrument, especially during this time where we're all kind of stuck at home, you're not at school, you're not in your rehearsals, you're not in your ensembles, I have one thing that I would recommend that you could do right now. The sizzle pull. The sizzle pull. is the logical evolution of the peat. For many of you that have, let me get out of the way so you can really see it clearly. There we go, should, should come into focus a little bit better. For many of you who have the peat, this is the evolution of the peat. It does everything that the peat does and a lot more. It's like the peat on steroids. It has another, what, 10, 15, 20 um, variations that you can use. It's solid metal. It has some cushion beads on it, not to tear up the inside of your mouth. This is the sizzle pull. You can get this along with a tutorial for it. If you didn't want to embark on the best number one rated amateur improvement program in the world, which is my 16 week brass upper register course, the new revised one if you're not ready to take on that and tackle that which actually that's the one that you should really be doing but if you just wanted to try something that's easy not going to take a lot of time but will give you almost instant results over anything else that you could try i mean i've looked at everything that is out there anything that you can buy anywhere this will do it the sizzle pull This is a pull. Today, you are going to learn how to play one half step higher on the trumpet in one week. This is a trumpet lesson on how to play higher notes on the trumpet. The trumpet technique that I'm going to show you today has really helped me improve my range, actually more than a half step, but we're going to let you guys experience the half step increase in range in high notes on your trumpet by using this one amazing technique. And thanks to this one amazing technique that I'm gonna show you today, I am able to play extremely well in the upper register of the trumpet. Now I should warn you, I'm not going to be giving you generic, same old advice that you've heard time and time again, maybe even here on YouTube, definitely if you're a music major, of practicing long tones, practicing the Schlossberg, blah, 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 you already know that, so I'm not going to be talking about that here. I'm going to be giving you this amazing technique that will work in seven days. You probably already know who I am, but for those of you just watching me for the first time, I'm Kurt Thompson of TrumpetSizzle.com. Let's dive right in to this amazing technique. You know, a long time ago, I was like you, struggling to increase my range, my accuracy, my power, 
and the real biggie, the endurance, the ability to last an entire rehearsal or performance. And yes, yeah, some of it does work. You know, I tried the long tone thing. In fact, I still play long tones. I still do that, but not as a way to really jack up my range. I mean, I tried that. I had trumpet teachers that told me to lip buzz and mouthpiece buzz 45 minutes a day before I even touched the horn. I tried all that stuff. I didn't really get much out of it, folks. And we're just a few days away from St. Patty's Day, so why not tilt the odds in our favor? I got all green on because this is my lucky day, but it's going to be even your luckier day when you get this extra half step and range in one week. This is not a joke. This is the real deal for improving higher notes on your trumpet in just one week. This is quite cool. You just have to do it. All right, here we go. First, you are going to be taking the trumpet mouthpiece and placing it in the center of your chops the way you normally would. You're going to start off on a relatively easy note. Say, for example, middle C. Now watch carefully. I'm going to repeat middle C going to my left, and this will probably be your right, but I'm going to repeat it several times as I slide the mouthpiece across my chops to my left corner. That's probably your right. Watch. Now bring it back to center and go to the other direction. This way. Crazy, right? Crazy like a fox. Now let's try going up to D. Right in the center, over. Bring it back to the center and head the other direction. Wow! You're probably saying, hey Kurt, what's so amazing about that? You are adding a different stress in a different placement on the chops that you're not used to doing. It's going to throw you for a little bit of a loop. And then watch the range start to happen, my friend. So we did C, we did D, and you want to keep going as high as you can until you're no longer able to go across each direction. Let's fast forward. Let's pretend I'm trying to do this on a G above the staff, which is getting pretty high for this technique. Center. Over. Getting tough. Back center. We're going to go this direction. There we go. What? No. You didn't ask me right now to try this on a high C. It's a crazy, amazing, wild, quirky technique, but on a high C? Huh? What? Ah, oh, what the F. You want to hear it on a high C? It's going to sound ho horrible. It's going to sound god awful. Let's try it. center and to the other way. Woo! It was the green hat, the green, the look of the Irish, the reason I was able to do this on high C. Now, this technique is an amazing technique and you will get one half step in one week on your trumpet. This has been a trumpet lesson on how to play higher on trumpet. And actually, it will work for trombone, tuba, French horn, euphonium, baritone. Now, will this amazing, powerful trumpet technique allow you to do this?
Maybe not, maybe so, but you will get the one half step increase in your range on trumpet or any brass instrument. I promise you that in one week. So after going through this one amazing technique with me and having observed how to do it, did you learn something new today? Are you going to try this technique? Why wouldn't you try this technique? Well, anyway, if you did learn something new today, make sure to subscribe to my channel, Trumpet Sizzle. It's easy. Just click on that rectangular red button that says subscribe below, right below. Maybe it's right there. It's right there. Just click on it and you'll be automatically subscribed. I'd also hit that bell notification. That way, every time I upload something you might be interested in, you'll get a notification of it right away. And by the way, if you want exclusive training, courses, tutorials, practice aids, exercises, all for brass players, trumpet, tuba, euphonium, baritone, French horn, cornet, flugelhorn, then head on over to trumpetsizzle.com. trumpetsizzle.com. Now, I would like to turn it over to you. Are you gonna try this amazing, powerful technique to jack your range up in one week, one half step? Either way, let me know by leaving a comment below right now. This has been a trumpet lesson video on how to play higher notes on the trumpet, specifically on how to gain one half step in range in one week. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one. Okay, middle C, high C, and double C buzz, and that's the ultimate test in pure embouchure and lip strength. Notice I was doing the real lip buzz, I wasn't doing the little puff out your thing that 8th graders do. No, I was doing the real lip buzz with an embouchure set, I just fold in like I'm blowing into the horn. So make sure you're comparing apples to apples. What I did was the real lip buzz, free lip buzzing, like you got your armature set. So if you do this, that doesn't, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about real free lip buzzing, which requires an enormous amount of armature strength. And you can always just about count on the fact that if you can buzz a certain note, it's likely you can play about an octave higher than that. Buzz a high C, you can probably play double C. Buzz a middle C, you can probably play high C. Buzz a double C, like I just did, you can probably play a triple C, which is true. So there is a correlation between your lip buzz and your strength and what you do on the trumpet, what you do on any other brasses, where it doesn't really matter, tuba, trombone, whatever. So um, embouchure strength is the most important thing the most important aspect of um, brass playing. Take it away and you really have little left. Little left. You might as well just become a singer. I mean, you really do. If you don't have the embouchure strength, you, you can't play, uh, I don't know, maybe you can play um, in, your, in the low register and that's about all you're going to get if you absolutely have no strength here whatsoever. Um, nothing really is going to happen on the horn. You could, you could be an um, Olympic swimmer with great lungs and air. Um, no embouchure strength is going nowhere. So that, there you have it. And I will continue on um, with this brass improvement series right here. Hey, today we're going to be talking about chop strength or embouchure strength versus air. And um, it seems like every other day I'm getting an email from somebody um, with a counterpoint of view um, for myself about air. A lot of times you hear me say, um, air is not the main thing that's gonna get you your range. 
and it's not the only thing. And then people think that um, I, don't, I don't believe in air at all, and that's not true. Um, but we really need to figure things out. If Now, I love Don Jacoby and his stuff. Bill Adams is wonderful. In fact, um, I do a little bit of his stuff in my four-month upper register program, the lead pipe buzzing and stuff like that. So, And then the other yoga breathing techniques. But air, my friend, if you work only on air and think that's the holy grail to ultimate endurance and upper register, you're going to fail. That's just the bottom line. And we're going to find out why today. In fact, I'm going to prove that air is not the holy grail to upper register. It really is lip and embouchure strength. And then the second to that would be how you compress your air. So that is a very important part of being in upper register and playing that way, um, playing clearly in the upper register. So, um, and I'm not following a script here. I'm just thinking out loud, but um, you need to see a good up close demonstration. That's why I have this camera so close. I want you to notice um, how much air I'm really taking in to be able to get in the upper register. And if you have half a brain, you're going to figure things out that um, you got to have the chop strength. You got to have the lip strength. Lip strength is a little different than your embouchure. I mean, than the muscles that surround here. Don't believe me? Watch some autopsies. It's pretty gruesome. But you're going to see that the musculature of the face right through here our embouchure actually is different tissue than what you have right here and so this is a little something different here that we want to work on to get stronger you have to have lip strength to withstand the pressure of the air coming out so yes you do need to be able to have um, great air flow and to be able to really compress the air that's the most important part so even if you only had one lung if you had the mechanism set up to really compress that air and everything was synced and coordinated I'm sure that you could probably still play decently in the upper register and, and expand your range. I'm confident of that. And let's find out why that is. So uh, I'm going to put the mouthpiece up. First of all, I'm going to see if you can get the feeling of when I take a full breath. So here's a full breath. <sighs> okay, so you'll know when I'm taking a full breath. I'm sitting down, so you'll see that I have to do that. Now, if I take a partial breath, I'm, I'm not going to take a full breath. And by the way, this, is, this video is... Um, in lieu of me writing out a big email for my brass um, techniques improvement series I'm just basically it's going to be this video so you're not going to see a long email this is the next installment in the brass players improvement um, email series I do on Facebook so I'll um, just be watching this and take notes so uh, check this out and I'm going to try to make it clear when I do take a larger breath so you need to see my lips try to get it close I'm going to put the mouthpiece up. I'm going to take about 20% air. Here we go. That's it. That's only 20%, folks. Now, I didn't exactly have the accuracy that I wanted because I didn't have the airstream pushing it forward. But that's pure embouchure strength. Let's do it again. I'm going to take about the same amount of air, about 20%. Here we go. It's only 20 I think I got up maybe around the triple F range, give or take. Um, wasn't a lot of air there. Now, I will put in a lot of a lot more air. So let me take in um, double that. Let's go up to about 50%. That's about 50. So I'm getting more sound out. And the air um, that I'm blowing through my chops is more air, more quantity, and it's actually a, probably a little bit faster, of course. Now, because I'm blowing more air, that's activating um, all the muscle contraction in here. It's got to still um, stay sealed on the mouthpiece. Otherwise, the lips would fly up, and you're not going to be able to um, go up any higher. So anyway, that should be really clear. Let's just take another look at that. Um, not much air. So here we go. That's a big breath, and let me let it all out. Basically, you saw me playing a double G, that's a double concert F, on the trumpet with 
virtually no air. Did, did anybody check that out? I basically had hardly any air. And how loud was it? It came out about MF. So wait a minute. Now, let's go back to Don Jacoby. And um, we can even include Stamps and uh, some of these other guys, um, Bill Adams, uh, real big proponents. Even my hero, Bud Brisboy, real big proponent of um, his wedge breath. He was the, he was the original wedge breath guy. Um, shoe came after him. Bud, Boy, Bud Brisboy is the original, the originator of um, wedge breath breathing, in case you guys didn't know that. And there's actually two versions. The shoe version, Bobby Shoes, is a little bit different more applicable to like real-time playing but Bud Brisboy uh, basically said his way of um, breathing this wedge breath was the reason he could play so high and um, um, tell you the truth that was I don't believe that's true <laughs> the guy had incredible chops and um, uh, I'm pretty confident that even if he hadn't um, only one lung or wasn't breathing as quite as good as he did in the wedge breath um, that he originated, he could still play very, very well in the upper register. He had a natural setup, and so I think he was trying to explain why he could play so well. Sometimes when players are born with natural leverage and a natural ability to really compress air, they're not quite exactly sure what they're doing. So they, they look to rationalize how they're able to do it. You can watch Maynard. Um, one of the, the ultimate um, talent in upper register. His just look at his face. He had the nat he had a natural setup. His teeth and everything was just perfect for being able to get the high velocity out um, to play in the upper register. Now, of course, he had to work. He had to practice. You know, not shortchanging that. But I think at some point he was trying to figure out how he was actually doing it. He had just this ultimate talent. I mean, he had the perfect leverage just built into a system that a lot of us have to work a lot harder to get. And sometimes we don't even get, um, you know, get to that level. So um, he, you can watch in some of his master classes that he really explains um, about his, that he worked a lot on his breathing. And then he leans back. He's really big about bending knees and leaning back. And I'm going to tell you something. And uh, Maynard is also one of my heroes, just along with Bud. But they're trying to explain how they're able to play so easily and well the upper register when, in fact, they had just like the ultimate amount of talent to be able to do so in natural setup. Um, I'm confident that you can take in a big gulp of air and practice yoga, lean back, bend your knees, and you're not going to be sounding like Maynard. And you're not going to really get that much upper register. You're going to have to do something to strengthen this um, area up here in your face. You have to have the strength up here. There's just no question. And um, what do um, a lot of people tell you to do? Do long tones, take stuff up an take stuff up an octave, play in the upper register, and really work on your airflow, and you'll get there. Uh, nope, <laughs> it doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it. Now, it might for some people, some people who are already predisposed and have the natural great leverage in their in their face right here, their tongue. Maybe they got a small. If you have a smaller oral cavity and you're using your tongue arch, you really can speed up there a lot faster. So um, th there's a lot of things that really go into this to making um, natural leverage. So yes, the people that have gained a lot of range and can excel very well in the upper and extreme upper reg register of any brass instrument, if they did the long tones, if they really worked on their breathing, if they played stuff up an octave, they might actually just get um, to where they wanted to be and where everybody wants to be but mainly because they had already a predisposition, predisposition for natural leverage and, um, and a great um, um, compression ability just through their genetics. So um, the rest of us, uh, you're going to have to really be strategic about getting this strength. And unfortunately for most of us, not one method and not one technique is going to get you there. In other words, uh, you can't just do Bill Adams' method and get there. It's going to work for some people, but will it work for you or me? I don't know. Um, Claude Gordon, love it. And I actually got something out of it, but is it going to work for you? I've, I've been teaching for a long time, and that Claude Gordon doesn't work for everybody. It works for me, and um, not ultimately, but you know, it did help me out at one point. So I love the Claude Gordon stuff. Uh, Roy Stevens. So... Uh, palming and all that kind of stuff. Will it work for you? It may. 
and it may not. Reinhardt, all these other methods that are out there, Cat Anderson is the, probably the, the toughest method to actually go through. So there's a whole bunch out there. Uh, the only question is, will it work for you? And those methods are successful for some people, but not for everybody. Of course, we already know why it's not successful for everybody. It's just fact. If one method was actually successful at producing um, gorgeous high notes and upper register abilities and endurance, then we would all only use that one method. Think about it. Let's use our brain here. If one method was that successful, we, you wouldn't be listening to this right now, and I wouldn't be talking about it. Everybody could just do it. So the fact of the matter is not one method is perfect for everybody. As a result, that's the whole nature of my four-month upper register course. Uh, there are 65 techniques, and these techniques come from um, every method you can think of. The bulk of it are actually my techniques, and I include a lot of breathing for compression and some other stuff. So you have to um, take the macro approach to really build in the strength. We don't know which one, which particular technique is going to do it for you. I'm confident that um, out of 65, 5 or 10 are definitely going to be the magic bullet for you. But what's the magic bullet for you? Don't know. And whatever it is, it won't be the same for me or the same for the next guy or gal. So you really have to use your intelligence here if you want to improve your upper register. And keep in mind, the I don't care what instrument you play. I don't care if you're a college professor or you're a comeback player or um, you're a hobbyist, or you're a pro player, whatever, it doesn't really matter. What matters is you have to keep improving your range. You can't be subtle on your range, wherever it is at today, because the more range you have, what happens, even if you don't want to play double Cs, um, classical guys out there, if you can play a double C, what happens here? Boom, the pressure comes off your lips when you're playing in the, in the uh, tessitura that you normally play in, whether it's middle C up to maybe E's. So you don't, you don't have to um, have the desire to play double C's. It's just if you can play them in your practice, the pressure comes off here. You get a better sound, a bigger sound, and a lot more endurance. So let's take one more look, and then I'm going to wrap it up here. Really, the air is important. And to compress the air, you really have to arch the tongue in your mouth up, like you're saying N or E or T. Your tongue's actually like this that it's doing the arch like that and you're blowing the air from the back of your throat up and over the tongue and it comes out the aperture now that's great we got to have that air but if you don't have the super strong embouchure chops and the lip able to contract and hold that air into the mouthpiece all the air is just going to be useless for you and that's um, this brass improvement email series. Hope you get a lot out of it. You're seeing a real good close up of me, maybe too close. Let's take another look at the mouthpiece. So I'm putting the mouthpiece right on my chops and take a small amount of air. Okay, not a whole lot of pressure there, really. And that was probably about 30% of my air capacity. That should prove a point. It should really prove a point that, yes, work on your air, but you need to focus a lot more on how to get this going here. And let me just leave you with this. If you're pounding away and banging your head at one method, and you keep wondering why it doesn't work, but you know it should work because it works for everybody else, well, that's um, erroneous thinking right there. You really need to take the shotgun approach. I'm here to tell you, you got to take the shotgun approach, the macro point of view. Uh, when it comes to really increasing your strength in your face, your lips, and everything else. you just got to do it. Otherwise, you're going to be one of those guys that um, sticks with a method um, because you don't want to, um, I guess, admit that you've made the wrong decision. You'll stick with that me method for all your life, and you'll always have problems in the upper register. So use your intelligence. Think about things in an intelligent way. And I'm Kurt Thompson. Hope this made a little sense to you. And today's date, by the way, happens to be March 7th, 2013. Take care.
talk about trumpet high notes, trumpet lessons, and trumpet mouthpieces. Now, a lot of people think that if you can play high, it's because you're playing on a shallow mouthpiece. In fact, a lot of people that are unable to play high, when they hear someone play high, will say that they're using a, a cheater mouthpiece or a shallow mouthpiece to be able to get those notes. That's not necessarily so. There's the right tool for the job. So what I wanted to point out today, I want to dispel a couple of myths. Um, I do happen to play on a shallower mouthpiece. It is a Neil Sander 17S. Um, but is this the only reason why I'm able to play high? Is it the only reason why other trumpet players who are um, quite adept in the upper register of the trumpet, their mouthpiece, is it, the, is it the only reason why they can play high? I don't think so. I think that you have to practice the right techniques in the right way for the right amount of time to be able to get your upper register the way you want it. Now, I wanted to go through a couple of mouthpieces that are quite common. Uh, let's pull out, this is the Bach 1.5C. I'll see if I can get it up there in the, in the camera for you. So you know that I'm really showing you the real deal. Uh, probably can't really see it. Let's see if I can turn it a little bit. There we go. Take my word for it. That's a Bach 1.5C. Yeah, it's a little bit cold. Now, according to a lot of people who can't play high, I shouldn't be able to hit a double C on this one. Now, I will tell you that the mouthpiece I play on, I play on it for a reason. I like the sound I get. I like the tone. I like the accuracy. I like the volume I get out of it. Uh, otherwise, I could just play on any mouthpiece, right? So this one here will probably not sound as good to me and have the projection and some of the other qualities that I love in my Neil Sanders, but will I be able to play a double C on this one like I do on mine? If the people who can't play high that put out this myth that, that um, you can only play high with a cheater mouthpiece are right, then I should not be able to play much maybe beyond a high C on this one. So let's find out. This is a Bach uh, one and a quarter, I'm sorry, Bach one and a half C. Now I'll just play a middle C here. No problems there. Does seem a little bit harder than mine. Whoa, wait a minute. That was a double C. It was on a Bach one and a half C mouthpiece. Well, it looks like I just broke that myth that you have to be able to use a cheater mouthpiece to be able to play high. Now there's a lot of people that play on this one, a lot of symphonic players um, that uh, poo poo high notes. So they play on this one. Uh, they don't really have to play much more than a high C or a high D in their symphonic and orchestral works, even the professional trumpet players I'm talking about in major symphony orchestras. This is one of their favorite mouthpieces right here. Um, when I use this on a regular job or a gig for um, playing major stuff, um, playing lead, no, I wouldn't, because um, this makes life more difficult. But, you heard it right here, folks. I played a double C on this Bach one and a half mouthpiece. Let's see if I can show you it again. Well, before I put this one away, I got a couple other ones to show you. Let me put, you, let me put it right back in. This is the Bach one and a half C mouthpiece. I'll put it right back in my horn. Let's just see if that was a fluke. Maybe it's a one-time fluke and I won't be able to get it again. No, if it wasn't a fluke, I am able to play high on a Bach one and a half mouthpiece. Let's set that one aside. Now, what is the most common trumpet mouthpiece in all the world? If you answered a 7C, you are correct. I'm going to see what happens when we get out the 7C. Now watch this video carefully because this is all uncut. There's the 7C. Can everybody see it? I'm going to leave it in the video. I'm coming back around. 
coming back around, there's no cutting or editing, here's the box 7C, this is what you get typically when you buy a new horn, typically what beginners play on it, very few professionals play on a 7C, there might be one out of a thousand that would play on a 7C, well, let me try it. Now supposedly, um, I shouldn't be able to play on high on this one either, right? It's a 7C mouthpiece, not a cheater mouthpiece, not a lead mouthpiece, let's see what happens. Now, if you watch the video, I've been going on continuously, there's, so there's been no monkey business. It's still in my horn. And it's cold. Try to double C there. Well, lo and behold, I'm able to get a double C on this 7C mouthpiece. Shouldn't be able to do that, should I? According to the people who can't play high and who use typically the larger mouthpieces, I shouldn't be able to play high on that, should I? Okay, so I played on a box 1.5C, played a double C. I played on a box 7C, played a double C. <laughs> Let's get out just a couple more. This one here is, this is the Bach 10.5C. Now this is the mouthpiece that a lot of classical players um, who really can't play high will, will actually use in their piccolo. Let's see if I can show it to you. Sorry. It's not coming in clear. There you go. You can see it's there. That's the Bach 10.5C. I'll leave it in the frame so you can see me put it right on my horn. This is the one that a lot of classical players, professional, principal, symphonic players all across the country, the major metropolitan um, symphony orchestras will pop this and when they got to play something high or they'll put it in their piccolo and then they go back to their one and a half C. They'll put the box two and a half C in. It's cold. Let me warm it up. Middle C. High C. Double C. I'm going to pull right on my horn. You saw exactly what I was playing on. This is no trick photography here. It's a Bach 10 and a half C. Oh, what is this? This is a Bach 12. Bach 12 C. We'll try that one. I've actually never played on a 12 C before. I borrowed a couple of these mouthpieces just for this demonstration. About 12C, I have no idea how I'd play this one. It is probably a little bit more smaller than the 10 and a half C, I'm guessing. clue what I'm going to get on this thing. You can see it's a huge, huge, deep, 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 deep cup. French horn mouthpiece. What, what is it here? It's 11. It's a Vincent Bach 11. French horn mouthpiece. So I still have it here. Let me put it in my horn. Of course you know it won't fit properly. But it's in there. Let's just see what I can get with this. It's not going to sound pretty. It's going to be out of tune probably swim around, but it's a French horn mouthpiece. Um, I really shouldn't be able to play too high on it. Most French horn players can't play too high, so let's see what will happen. Definitely a different tone, a lot warmer. I see now. Real muffled. It's probably going to be very difficult to get the double C out. You heard it right there. Got a double C on a French horn mouthpiece in my trumpet. So, let's go back to my mouthpiece. Neil Sanders 17S. There you go, you can kind of see it there. There we go. Neil Sanders. You can tell it's beat up. This is the very mouthpiece that I played Gabriel, Gabriel Maynard Ferguson's Gabriel on. Uh, Quite a number of years ago, so if you happen to see my video doing that one, um, 
or hear it somewhere. This is the same mouthpiece I used for that one. Now let's go back. You're going to notice that I can, of course, still play the high note. It's just going to have more of a punch, more power. That's your middle C. Here's your high C. Love it, love it the way it comes out. You notice that all in all these mouthpieces, I was able to hit the double C. All of us have different dental structure, different facial features up here, and therefore what what works for somebody, for example, this works for me, might not work for you. And that's why I would definitely recommend, and I recommend all my students to spend some time going through different mouthpieces and making sure that mouthpiece is uh, appropriate for what you do. This mouthpiece may not be the perfect mouthpiece for a symphonic player, but it shouldn't be the reason a symphonic player would say that they can't play high because they need a cheater mouthpiece. I've just broken that myth right here. You heard me play a double C on a Bach one and a half mouthpiece. You've heard me play, uh, that's a one and a half C mouthpiece. You heard me play a double C on a Bach seven C mouthpiece. That's the standard mouthpiece that every little kid gets uh, when they take their horn right out of the case for the first time. So what can we learn from this? You, first of all, need to be taking lessons from someone like myself or some you got to take lessons from somebody who already can do what you want to do. That's number one. Number two, put the notion of mouthpieces allowing you to play high out of your head and actually do the real trumpet work. What does that mean? You actually got to practice. And you got to practice the right stuff in the right amounts. That's what we learned today. You don't need a cheater mouthpiece to play high. You should be able to play high on any mouthpiece you pick up. I just proved it here. You know, I want you to go to TrumpetSizzle.com. That's www.TrumpetSizzle.com. I have an array of uh, trumpet video lessons. Um, my main job is teaching trumpet from beginners all the way up to advanced and professionals. Yes, I do have a couple of professionals from time to time that come in that want to learn how to improve their range. Always remember, it takes about 5,000 hours of concentrated practice from beginning whether you started in fifth grade or if you're starting as an adult, doesn't matter, log those hours in. It takes about 5,000 hours just to reach the very bottom of the professional caliber trumpet player. So if you're wondering where you're at or why you're not where you want to be, think about how many hours you've logged in since you began playing. And if it's not 5,000, chances are you need to put in some more practice time. And I'll repeat it again, you got to get with the right teacher. In fact, let me just bring that up before we close it. You know, if you go to Google and you type in trumpet lessons, you're going to see uh, quite a variety of people on there, including myself. I come on page two right now. I'm trying to get on page one. But you want to get with a trumpet instructor who not only can tell you how to play high, show you how to play high, but actually has been out there in front of an audience with different bands playing um, upper register trumpet music. Anyway, what I've noticed is that a lot of these trumpet players that you know, you're going to find that pop up on Google on page one right away, uh, if you try to search their name and find out what they've done, what they've played, um, some of them you can't even find a live video of them playing. But their, their marketing is really good. So I would just caution you that as you're looking for someone to help you out with your uh, trumpet lessons and improving high range and everything else, you want to get for, with somebody who can actually play the trumpet, play the way you want to play, and has actually proved it with bands and other live audiences. Go to TrumpetSizzle.com. See you there.
cannot play high. Well, I just demonstrated one of them. This. This. The meat. The muscle. Right? But you already knew that, right? Yeah. You know you got to have chops. You got to build this. Everything. All these muscles, everything. It's all got to be built up strong. So you know that one, but maybe you didn't. Uh, maybe you thought it was talent. Okay. A lot of people think it's just talent. Can't play high. I was just born to play third chair. Just the way it is. Don't get mad about it. Don't beat yourself up over it. You just weren't born with the talent to be able to play high. Uh, actually, some people feel that way. But that is 100% wrong. 100% incorrect. That's your belief system, but it's not reality. Your belief system, but not reality. So the top reason that you can't play high is you haven't gone through the process of training this and the whole mechanism from diaphragm to here to here to out to the horn. You haven't gone through that process. Now you can look at vi uh, video, YouTube after YouTube. In fact, I just crossed over the 600 mark on my YouTube channel. Uh, videos available to the public. You can watch them all. You're not going to get that miraculous improvement in range and endurance just by watching videos, even though I'm giving you some good advice and others are giving you good advice. You have to go through the process. The process is systematically applying so many different angles at your chops, your breathing, your tongue strategically over a period of time infused with momentum that's what the process is and um, you're not likely to have gone through that process if you're watching this video or maybe you're just watching it just for giggles but um, you have to go through the process it seems like a lot of teachers that can actually play decently high are not taking their students through the process and um, as a result the students don't end up playing as well as the teacher and they don't even make that much improvement. It's about the process, not about one or two techniques or a routine that you're going to do. About the process. <clears throat> so, if you watch my stuff, you will get better. And you are certainly going to play a little bit higher, a little bit better, a bigger sound, a bigger tone, uh, more accuracy, better endurance. Yes, but you're not going to get that miracle, amazing, oh my God, I was playing high Z's and D's few months ago and now I'm zinging out double high G's now I can actually do some Broadway shows if I wanted no you're not going to get that by watching just um, individual random videos on how to play trumpet better from anybody you have to go through the process I happen to know what that process is by the way and um, according to most of the people that have been working with me it seems like they know it now too and they can demonstrate it so let's go on to number two where the second reason the second top reason that you can't play high. That. 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 Tongue and tongue arch. Now, you can still play high without the tongue arch. <coughs> I'm going to play high right now, leaving my tongue dropped in a low C positioning. And now it's not going to sound good at all. How am I able to still get up there even though it sucked? I had the chops. But having the chops is one part of the equation. If you don't have the tongue arch, my friend, you can have the range. F. G. Weak, kind of brittle sounding, stiff sounding. Not that powerful. But I can get those notes. That proves to you right there that if you're still not doing some things right, that you can still gain some altitude 
just by developing your chops, but that's not going to um, be the panacea. And what you're thinking about is an end result of how you want to play. So the tongue arch, <coughs> the less space you have in your mouth when the air is coming out, you're going to zing out higher notes because the air is going to be speeding past the lips, vibrating them faster, vibrating the air that goes into here, coming out here is going to all be faster. Okay. So how do we do that? It's the tongue arch. And it's kind of one of the most elusive techniques on the trumpet. It really is. I, I get people that can actually play pretty decently um, up to high C, D, even E, and um, they're not using tongue arch, but they're so used to not using tongue arch that they can actually play sometimes at the professional level or as a professional in a symphony. It's quite amazing how they can do that. They're making things in life very, very hard by doing that, but yet they've accommodated not being able, not knowing about the tongue arch or not being able to do it. <coughs> so what if you had a screwed up embouchure, or what if you thought you didn't play correctly? Well, here's my natural setting. What if I played poorly? Let's move the mouthpiece over a little bit. There we go, see it? I'm way off my amateur. In fact, I'm over. What about the other way? Well, now I'm back to center. Move it over. Now I'm really playing not where I want to play. I can still do it, but it sucked that on that one side compared to the other. So I've, I've showed you that with no tongue arch, I can still play high. Playing on a totally screwed up embouchure, one side to the other like that, I can still play some, you know, actually into the upper register above high C. So it's the tongue arch. Tongue arch. So quit looking at whether or not you got a bad embouchure, a defective embouchure, whether or not um, you think that you're playing a little off center and your teacher's on you for that. Or you play too high, play too low. Um, you can work on that stuff later, but that's not your problem. The problem is tongue arch, um, especially if you've got the other part handled, the, um, the musculature, the armature, and the strength. But a lot of people don't got that handled either. But it's the tongue arch. With the tongue arch, you can do quite amazing things. So if you can play um, high B flats, Bs, and Cs with the perfectly executed and advanced tongue arch, that those high Cs automatically turn into Es and Fs with no change in the musculature and the strength that you know the embouchure here. Tongue arch works wonders. <coughs> That's the second reason that you can't play the and if it's the top the second reason or it's the second place why almost all brass players can't get altitude and can't have good endurance. It seems to be mis mystical and ambiguous, foggy, murky, unclear what the tongue arch really is. But basically if you can anchor take the tip of your tongue that's the tip. Take it and put it under, uh, um, behind your teeth, your lower teeth. Here's upper, lower. Take the tip, go down, and anchor it. I have the tip anchored right at the bottom of my lower teeth, where the teeth kind of almost turn into the gums, you know, right at that gum line, or you run out of teeth, and you can feel the wet gum. That's where you anchor the tip of your tongue. Yeah. And then the tongue arches up, like you're saying in, or E I N G swimming. Mm. Yeah, so that's when you're at maximum tongue arch. And here's a good test for you. Now I made another tutorial about this, but it was kind of shorter. So <clears throat> you can try this on different things. Purpose. Here's me going from second line G to C on purpose okay okay you're seeing movement here I'm also adding a little extra tension when I'm going up to give it push the way to really get the feeling 
<coughs> of tongue art, so it's not theory, it's actually something real, real that you're doing, is to purposely try not to get the top note, yet raise your tongue in an arch position. So right now, I'm going to take a big breath, and I'm going to hold a G, but during that time, what's happening inside my mouth is this. My tongue is arching up. You already know that tip is placed behind my teeth. So it's going here. Ah. Uh, up. And I'm purposely going to try not to get the C. Watch what happens. Hear that? Of course, it didn't sound good, but I'm purposely trying not to get the C. I don't want the C to come out. Watch again. Again. You notice no movement going on here at all, right? And I'm not. I'm really trying not to let the seed to come out. That's your assignment. If you can get that to happen, you've executed the tongue arch quite perfectly. Now, it doesn't stop there. The tongue has to be developed, and you have to be able to hold the tongue arch under a lot of undue pressure when you're above high C. That pressure will flatten down your tongue, and you'll, your range will drop. Not because you don't have chops, because you're not maintaining the tongue arch. So <clears throat> the tongue arch, is you got to get it. But then you have to develop it to withstand the pressure that will be inside your oral cavity when you're really playing in the upper register and beyond. Um, your tongue arch drops just a micromillimeter and you've lost um, two notes on your range, just like that. That's how easy it is. So watch, let's try it on a different note. Uh, low C. <laughs> I'm trying to do that, right? You can tell. What if I take a big breath and purposely stay on that low C? Don't let that G come out. Take a bigger breath this time. The first one came out air because I didn't have any air left. Even low C to G, which is a wider interval, isn't it? It's a, another note wider, so you're going to fifth. Um, now, a lot more air is coming out on low C than it is on G, because you, you have the placement of your jaw and your tongue even lower. But still, you could hear that something was happening. In fact, the air started to cut off and on that first one. Did you hear that? It was almost no air. I mean, it was just air coming out. But the low C would not come out. So don't think that was a mistake. The low C would not come out anymore. Let me just see if I can go for the air again, because that was pretty important. I'm raising the tongue up to the point where the low C will not vibrate anymore. Well, now that time the note came out. No, hold on, I try it again. I'm trying to keep the low C down, but I'm raising my tongue into a tongue arch. No, it's not going to do it this time. I guess it was kind of a fluke, but still, that was important um, to realize I'm trying to play the low C, which even beginners can get. So you know something was going on inside here. I mean, if I can't play the low C, something really is, is, bad, is bad, and it's going to, something bad is going to happen. Maybe the, the end of the world tonight. I can't play a low C. And if you can't play a low C, it's probably the same thing. Now, if I'm playing a low C and I do something inside my mouth that causes the low C not to come out, you know I'm doing something. You know something is going on. You just have to know that. So I was probably speeding up the air too fast for the low C to come out, and it was in the little twilight zone area right before the G was going to snap out. So um, I'm not even sure if I've even tried this on C to E. Now, I'm thinking that as you get more narrow in intervals, 
uh, but it's probably going to come out easier. So I'm not sure if this will be the best demonstration or not. Let's find out. <coughs> so middle C to E. Oh, nor normally. Now, without, I'm going to try to keep it at middle C and not let the E to come out. Oh no, the, okay, it gets easier as you go higher, actually. Yeah, okay, so that's why I was experiencing that air at the low C to G. So um, this demonstration is actually perfect for you at G to C. And if you do have a range up to about an A to a high C, um, you might want to try it from middle C to E because it's actually easier. But it might be so easy that you don't really get the feeling of it. So um, you've heard me do three different ones. G to C is commonly what I show students. Um, low C to G is going to be harder. And um, C to E is going to be easier. So you've got three different um, intervals that you can slur to. Um, using the tongue arch. Remember, you're trying not to let the top note come out. You're trying not to let the top note come out. That's what you're trying to do. But you're arching up. You're trying to arch the tongue as high as it will arch. But with the goal of not getting that top note. Because if you have the goal to get the top note, then you might add a little bit more pressure here. You might blow harder. You're going to be doing some things unconsciously that you've just already trained yourself to do to get the note to come out. That's why it's important to really, it might go against your ego, but really do not let that top note come out. Just keep arching the note up and hope it doesn't come out. And when the top note does come out, if it does for you, um, then you know that you've got the tongue arch decently perfected, um, but just not strengthened. I mean, the tongue arch, you either get it or you don't, right? It's, there's not really a gray area. You got it perfected, you can do it, or you don't have it at all. There's not really a middle ground. You either got it or you don't. After that point, it's about developing your tongue and the tongue, tongue arch to really be refined and just amazingly uh, versatile when you're playing. That's where I come in. Have you ever heard that I got a website called trumpetsizzle.com and that I teach a lot of people, uh, especially a lot of advanced and professional players uh, that want to get better with endurance and range? Well, if you haven't heard about it, um, you're just hearing it now. I actually do that. That's kind of actually what I'm good at. And um, I do I'm good at some other things too, but that's I kind of have this natural knack for helping people out with that. So if you'd like to learn more, uh, you can definitely look at more videos here. And if you're watching this, why not go ahead and subscribe? Uh, you can support me. You're, you're going to get an instant um, email when I put up new videos like this. And um, I don't know. I think that you're going to learn something and become a better player but if you really want to take the horse by the reins and run run with it you got to do something and that's called going through the process which i alluded to earlier in the video so but this this tutorial on tongue arch should help you and now if you're not getting the note to come out at all even though you're trying not to but it still doesn't come out um, that's where again you need a coach you need someone to work with you on that because that is the second reason you're not able to play high play with power of the upper register or even have great endurance if you're constantly playing in a low c position in the upper register you're gassing out all the muscles here you're just putting such a load on them and that's why you don't have any endurance so you might even have a little range where you have no endurance. you got to get the tongue arch. It's the second reason people have problems in the upper register and with endurance. Since you've already heard me say that, you might. It's a no-brainer. Work on it. Get it going. It's worth the investment in time. So, that's a wrap. Hey, guys and gals. Um, I've been using a cool little trick, tip, shortcut. Again, this is not a substitute for the process or for enrolling in lessons or, and specifically we're enrolling in some of my 
pedagogical specific courses like upper register, technique, lead trumpet playing, breathing. But I have found that this is a very potent and quick results producing technique. And I call it the frozen lip bend. I've scoured Google, YouTube, even that crappy little site called Vimeo. Uh, no, there's, there's nobody else that has come up with this. So the date of this video will be the copyright for this particular technique. It's the frozen uh, lip bend. We could almost call it deep frozen lip bends. And so you've seen people uh, demonstrate lip, lip bends almost in a half step fashion and it, and it looks impressive. They're doing things like um, folks I mean come on <laughs> so when you see someone a pro that's screwing around a lip bending like that uh, that's kindergarten stuff you want to you want to go up to the to the heavyweight league with the big boys then you do deep deep lip bends on any brass instrument not this little half step bullshit jargon that's not going to get you anything so here we go um, I like to play um, the uh, the F sharp in the in the G progression down. So play the F sharp. Now no valve. Soft and increase dynamics. Control baby, back it off. Okay, now that is the half step lip bend that you hear all the time. Except that was a deep, fro that was a frozen lip bend, not quite deep, but now it's going to get deeper. Now let's go to something that you don't hear anybody doing unless you've watched another of my tutorials on lip bending. We're going to go down to F natural, which is going to be the whole step below G. to triple pianissimo baby all right this uh, this is the big boy league and uh, you might not even be able to do what I just did but that doesn't mean that you couldn't do it with a little bit of practice with trying this this takes incredible resilient flexible strong powerful chops to be able to accommodate what I'm showing you now with this technique the deep frozen lip bend Let's go even deeper. Now, you'd never hear anybody, I haven't heard anybody <laughs> lip bend down to an E in this part of the range of the horn and the trumpet. So, G, D, now we're going down a minor third. Let's belt up. Incredible, incredible amount of control there and finesse to be able to accommodate that. Uh, you have a favorite celebrity trumpet player and you're, if you're friends with them, ask them to do what I'm doing. Uh, the odds are very considerable and stacked against them that they won't be able to do that. So well, now we're going to get into the extreme minority of all professional, actually this is not even professional, this is way above professional level of playing. And you have to have worked considerably on the physical aspects of brass playing to be able to accommodate this to go down a major third and control it. So G down to E flat. quadruple piano ladies and gentlemen again quite an exhibition in resiliency malleability flexibility powerful um, what other kind of adjectives can I come up with this it's just um, you really have to have excelled 
way above the typical professional commercial or orchestral player to be able to do this. Uh, but with this technique, you can. It's not going to happen overnight. But what is going to happen is as you keep working on this, you're going to notice that your sound opens up. Your flexibility just becomes like, like, a, like a hot knife through butter as you go through all registers of the horn and the facility of the horn. It's just going to be a piece of cake. Of course, your range is going to improve. Um, I think that this would be especially good for orchestral players uh, because I have a feeling that you're going to be able to open up and get that more brassy resonance on the mid and lower middle register of the horn, which is where a lot of this orchestral music is played, um, especially if you're not principal trumpet. So this could be very bene beneficial if you totally don't like the commercial and jazz idiom of playing and you're more into the classical, this could really benefit you in this particular register. Um, now let's go to no man's land. We're going to go down to perfect fourth. Man, this is like super deep. Uh, this is like the 12 foot um, uh, deep end of the pool where the you know the, the high dive is. So here we go. difficult in fact you even heard me falter a little bit I'm not perfect uh, I'm close to perfect but not no just kidding it's a new one. just kidding well when it comes to looks yeah that's yeah, been pretty close but when it comes to playing yeah you know I have my problems it's just like everybody else so um, uh, I guarantee you most of you are not going to be able to do that but you do not need to be depressed because you can start just on the F sharp in this progression down from middle G second line middle G for trumpets everybody else you can transpose to uh, the notes in your instrument that would be practical. I've just thrown it out here, for example, probably for trombone, I probably would be playing first position, uh, first position F, uh, that's fourth line F in the bass clef staff. I, for trombone people, I would probably start right there, first position, and uh, then of course you're gonna have to bend it down without moving the slide, right? So you're gonna find it very, very difficult. But that's just an example if you're playing another brass instrument. Uh, now let's go for the, the quintessential granddaddy gold medal Olympic winner. Um, yeah, if you can get this one and control it, and I gotta be honest with you, sometimes in some days I can't get this one. That's how difficult it is. But that would be going down the tritone from G down to C sharp, um, D flat, and harmonic. Uh, this is this is almost a nightmare to try to do on a regular basis and be consistent, but I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot right now. So we're playing our G down to D flat. Oh, almost didn't get it. Uh, folks, that was rough and tough, rough and tough and tumble. Uh, if you can do that and control it, um, um, you just certainly have to have chops. I would almost bet without hearing you playing anything else that you probably have a good core to your sound, amazing dynamics in all registers, and just great facility all over the horn, whatever brass instrument it is. So this was Kurt Thompson with another amazing proprietary and unique tip, trick, and technique for brass players that you've never heard before. And the date of this video will be its copyright. No one else has done the deep frozen lip bend. Try it. You'll like it. Comment below. I'll see you in the next one. You know, I've been kind of messing around doing the, the palming Dr. Charles Colin lip slurs and lip trills, and I've been finding it quite tough. I mean, you can't use any mouthpiece pressure. So I'll just give you an example. You know, you do the horn here, you know, it's palmed. You see, you make, you make, your, you make your hand. Now, French horn players will probably have to do this. 
Um, trombone players, maybe also. Baritone players, I'm not exactly sure how you would do that unless you could put your, like you know how a tuba will put their tuba in a big tuba stand. And if you put the tube in the stand and you just went up to it with the mouthpiece like that, that would be almost the equivalent. So if you could put your euphonium or baritone in some kind of a stand, then you could probably get the technique we're after here. So you make your hand like a shelf. And I would just kind of mess around doing some lip trill, just seeing where I was at. Um, as you've heard in other past tutorials, I've been able to you know lip trill pretty decently up to triple G's. But that was using a tremendous amount of... Um, mouthpiece pressure be at the very end so that was pretty tough for me but here I am I'm gonna, actually I'm going to do it this way so you can see that's C D E E D um, obviously that's E to G G to B flat B flat to C So that was B flat to high C. Now, um, also I'm doing these rather loud. I would say that was just pushing probably forte. Uh, you're not going to get too much out of your lip trills in the Charles Conan book if you're playing them pianissimo or piano. Uh, I recommend all my students that were at, the, at least at the MF mark. MF to F is good. Probably fortissimo is not good. Uh, you're going to be blown so loud you're going to be de defeating the purpose of the technique. So keep these around MF to F. So that was... So B flat to high C. So palming. Now look, look how I got it. I don't know if you can see. Uh, I'm only using the weight of the horn. I'm not doing this. I'm not grabbing and pulling. There we go. Let's try to go a little higher. That was C to D. D to E. Now this will probably come out flat. And then, geez, I don't even know if I can make this last one. I can't get the G to lock in, but I will get it. So um, I was going for the trill from F to double G. I think it kind of came out. It got a little bit weak. Let's see if I can get it again. on a double G now folks I'm probably making that look too easy so I want you to try it and why would I say I'm making it look too easy well uh, one of the techniques in my course does kind of focus on the Roy Stevens William Costello no pressure system palming now we're not doing it exactly as Roy would have had his students do because I'm not doing the the whole gap in the teeth thing and the forward jaw and the and the um upstream type of armature that is the Stevens armature so we're not really doing that but we're actually doing the physical exercise to kind of strengthen up our chops so the, the reason I mentioned that, that that might have looked too easy is because when people come into my course a lot of people have trouble just doing this <laughs> just going to the E now that's just a slur going up I would say more than half the people getting in my course cannot do what I just did there. That was simply going up to a high G. Low C, G, C, E, G. And to go up the next one, now we're going to whittle out almost all people that start my course. That's the B flat. I might, if I had 10 people start my course of over the last quarter, uh, maybe two would be able to do what I just did there. And then finally, I don't know, if I had 
10 people start my course over the live course now, the one that they're seeing me every week live, uh, either via Skype or on the phone, uh, maybe one, one would be able to do what I just did right there. And that's just a maybe. So take this technique to heart in this drill, and it's a good challenge. I mean, we're all uh, brass players, and it seems like brass players, and especially trumpet players, like to, like a good challenge in the competition and to challenge ourselves. And, wow, can you think of a better challenge than this? Yeah, because, I mean, come on. If I got on normally... I mean, what the hell? I just did a, you know, that lip trill from double C to double D. And if I warmed up a little bit more, I know it can go another three or four steps higher. Because I'm playing normally and got the right pressure that I want. So this shows you, you saw that I got, I kind of, I kind of thinned out um, going up to that double G lip trilling it. So um, if, if I can go an octave higher playing normally, you know there's something to this technique. And I highly recommend that you Start playing around and challenging yourself. Think outside the box. Use your brain. Uh, you have to constantly keep moving upwards and expanding everything and advancing your horn. It doesn't stop. It hasn't stopped with me. I'm still looking at, at areas. Um, right now, I'm looking at the jazz area. Although, I feel like for a guy that's, you know, done it for, I haven't, even, I'm not even really seriously doing it, but I am looking at it. I am doing some different things with the jazz and jazz improvisation. And I feel like the little effort and input that I've done has actually um, got me, you know, a couple of spots upwards. So now do I really have to do all the jazz? No, because I have classical skills and commercial skills that tend to put me ahead of the pack and make me stand out. But I'm not satisfied with that because I want to keep expanding, keep improving. And so I'm looking at the jazz as kind of a last frontier for me. And I've been noticing when I've just been kind of fooling around playing uh, with some of the, the legends of jazz, the living legends, it's at the point now where um, I feel like I'm kind of hanging in there with them. I mean, just on some of the recordings, and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm able to hang in there with these guys. And jazz is definitely not my forte now. Who knows, maybe down the road it will be. So the whole idea is you keep trying different things and experimenting and adding different things to your regimen to keep improving. Um, what is the opposite of that? The opposite of that would be to, for 30 years, pull out your Claude Gordon book and be doing this. On and on and up. I mean, if you're doing that for 30 years and you're doing nothing else, I can guarantee you just aren't that far along, my friend. Be smart. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson at TrumpetSizzle.com and here on YouTube, you're a brass instructor. I'm a professional trumpet player and teacher. And I want to ask you a question. Would you like to learn how to skyrocket your range, improve your endurance, and reduce mouthpiece pressure? At the very least, you should discover that improving range and endurance is a process. It is not one book you're going to read, not one ebook, it's not one lesson you're going to take with a celebrity trumpet player. It is a process that you will have to go through. If you're willing to go through this process, I can almost guarantee that you will get fantastic results on this instrument or any brass instrument. And for right now, I would just like for you to subscribe to my channel. Look down below and click the subscribe link. I would love to have you as a subscriber on my channel, Your Brass Instructor. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one. Hey, this tutorial deals with rolling, something that is confusing a lot of people out there. So let's just be clear what this is. In fact, here's an exercise that you can practice. It doesn't really matter if you play tuba or French horn or trumpet or trombone. Um, you want to be able to roll, make your lips disappear. Okay. That's a double C roll in position.
I did a you know a tutorial going over this, but I'm just doing it again. Practice. This is a technique. Just practice rolling your lips in. If you can't do that, you're not going to be able to play in the upper register that well or with a lot of ease. you got to be able to roll in. Teeth are shut. Don't be confused and think that you're doing this. That the lip is over the teeth. And here too. No, we're right here. See, teeth were shut. They're open for me to roll in. Open, roll in. Now they're over the teeth. I shut the teeth. So, a technique for you that would be a value is to make sure you get the roll in. And if you can't do it this way, you're not going to be able to do it on the horn in real time. So this is kind of a, a you know, a bike with training wheels right now. You're not using the horn, you're just practicing the roll in. Double C, that's a double C rolling right there. High C probably be, well for me anyway, it would be probably high C, double C. Hope you enjoy this close-up of my lips. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson at TrumpetSizzle.com and here on YouTube, you're a brass instructor. I'm a professional trumpet player and teacher, and I want to ask you a question. Would you like to learn how to skyrocket your range, improve your endurance, and reduce mouthpiece pressure? At the very least, you should discover that improving range and endurance is a process. It is not one book you're going to read, not one ebook, it's not one lesson you're going to take with a celebrity trumpet player. It is a process that you will have to go through. If you're willing to go through this process, I can almost guarantee that you will get fantastic results on this instrument or any brass instrument. And for right now, I would just like for you to subscribe to my channel. Look down below and click the subscribe link. I would love to have you as a subscriber on my channel, Your Brass Instructor. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one. Hey, one of my students, Tom Granoff, told me about a master class that he went to quite a long time ago where Bobby Shu came in, talked about his breathing techniques like the wedge breath and all that, and then picked up the trumpet by a second valve and played a few high notes that were pretty meaty. And um, so I thought I would try to see if I can demonstrate the Bobby Shu. I would just call this probably the Bobby Shoe No Pressure um, High Note Test. So you can do this after you watch this. You can try it right out if you're in a practice room. So what I was told by Tom is that I guess um, Bobby just grabbed the middle valve like that and proceeded to play a couple. I don't. Whoop, my valve's starting to unwind. Proceeded to play a couple of notes. So I'm going to try it here. Just a couple of notes. G. So that was a pretty loud double G just by doing the Bobby Shoe method of holding on to the middle valve. You, even though I was trying to pull in, you really can't pull in too much, folks, as opposed to when you got, you know both arms grabbing and pulling in. So you got just your fingers holding on to this. Part of it's holding the weight of the horn from dropping. So anyway, that's the Bobby Shoe uh, no pressure high note test. You saw it here probably for the first time because I just found out about it from Tom Granoff. Thanks, Tom. Thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here.
Have a great day. This exercise is meant to increase your endurance, I mean in a huge amount, and your range, and you have to actually work. And that's one thing a lot of you are not willing to do. So what you're going to see is me doing the Cat Anderson Whisper Quiet Middle C for five minutes. Trust me. You do that for 30 days in a row and you're going to notice something big time happens to your endurance and you'll probably get a half step pop in your range. Um, that's not a bad trade off for doing your five minutes of practice a day. So um, let's see if we can put this. Hold on, I got to fix the phone here first. Yeah, so I have this set at five minutes. I was just trying to adjust the screen so it won't go off. And I might, this was set at like 30 seconds just to, to go to sleep. So let's do it for five minutes. In fact, once you know what I'm doing, why don't you get out your horn and go right along with me and let's kick some butt together. Okay? So let's start the countdown. By the way, if this note sounds pretty on your horn, you are doing it the wrong way, my friend. Listen to how I do it. This note does not lock in. And the closing your teeth stuff is optional in my opinion. I'm going to just do it normally without my teeth shut. But it's going to be at the threshold of where the tone quits. The tone should be kind of bad on this one. The pitch should waver around because you're never locking it in. You're playing at about four keys. Here we go. Five minutes.
right, cat. Folks, you want to get some serious range and endurance, then you need a man up. Or if you're a gal, you need a woman up. I mean, you need to work your butt. You try that exercise I just did and watch how it exhausts you. Basically, you're not breathing for five minutes. That is the Cat Anderson Whisper Quiet 5-Minute C. It's an advanced technique in my course. And I'm here to tell you, you do that once a day, like I did, five minutes for a month. You might double your endurance and you might throw a half step on top of your range just for five minutes a day. But you're going to work. Did it look easy? You do it. And you do it for 30 times in a row for a month. But when you have that extra range and that double of endurance, then you got to come back and thank this guy right there on this video. Okay? You make a comment. If you haven't subscribed, you subscribe right now. And you come back in the middle of January with more power, a little bit better range, and a lot more endurance, and you make a comment right there for everybody to see that it does work. Kurt Thompson, TrumpetSizzle.com, and I was just doing the Cat Anderson 5-Minute Whisper Quiet C. Say hello to my little friend. <laughs> yes, folks, I found this little contraption online, and um, I'm going to be doing an experiment, so I'm going to make a couple of subsequent videos on this to let you know what happens. I'm actually doing this just to increase um, my power. And volume um, I don't know if you figure this out I don't really need to increase my range and I definitely don't need to increase my endurance but power I'm all for being the most dominant powerful brass player anytime any place anywhere baby and uh, let's just see what this does I just did like what 10 reps of that and um, feel there's something going on now this is an isometric activity kind of um, because you actually have a device, so I mean, you're actually doing, you know, an exercise where isometric means you're kind of like um, tensing muscles against themselves. You know, kind of like um, if you just kind of grip your fist, go like that, that's kind of isometrical. Where if you had something that you were squeezing, that would be um, just more of a regular type of calisthenic exercise. So, for those of you who follow my stuff, I think you might get a kick out of what happens. Uh, I like to give things a decent amount of time, so I'm going to give this this little contraption here uh, about a month to see what happens and see if I notice when I get ready to blow. In fact, I might get out my old trusty decibel meter. Remember, remember, remember that one from a couple years ago? And uh, the threshold of pain, if you remember watching that one and the new one I just put out, the threshold of pain for your ears is 130 decibels. Now, if you watched my most, if you watched that one from a couple years ago, which I just recently kind of edited, I got my double up to 126.5, folks. Now that's that's train whistle blowing loud, and then I I uh, included a couple examples where you know I, I buried the band with that note. What I would like to see is if this guy can get me up to that 130 mark on my double A. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, that would be cool. That means um, anybody that I don't like would experience the threshold of pain at 130 decibels on my double A. Yes, it will become a legitimate weapon of vengeance. And you too can be able to exact revenge on people that rub you the wrong freaking way. So, for those of you who play trumpet, watch my progress on this little contraption. And by the way, I'm thinking that um, even if you don't play trumpet, guys, this could be a wonderful Christmas gift for your girlfriend or wife. 
<laughs> you know what I'm talking about, baby? Yes, so even if she doesn't play trumpet or is not a musician, you still may want to order this for her. Get my drift? Let's, let's exit with um, a little bit more exercise here. Ready? Thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. Um, how about, let's see if I can get my double A up into the 120 range as well. I'm proud of that. That's almost 130. I think I got up to 127 range. It's a wonderful little tool. You ought to get one of these decimal meters and you can kind of critique yourself on how much power you really have. Okay, here we go. Um, double C. Lip buzzing is a poison, so you really have to be careful. This is a lip buzzing tutorial, Lip Buzzing 101. And um, I'm going to get some close-up shots here of my chops while we lip buzz. Lip buzzing can really cause you a lot of consternation. It could set you back. It could destroy your chops. It can make you have the inability to even get a tone out on your brass instrument. This tutorial is for all brass instruments. A lot of people think it's only for trumpet, because that's my main instrument, but it's trumpet. 
trombone, French horn, baritone, tuba, euphonium. If you buzz a metal mouthpiece into an instrument, this tutorial is for you. First of all, lip buzzing is a poison, and that's why some people have tried it and then issue it because it really screwed them up. You know, um, some people take nitroglycerin for heart problems. Think about it, folks. Nitroglycerin explodes. That's that little liquid that if you um, have a certain amount of it, you throw it, it will really explode like dynamite. So nitroglycerin is a poison, but yet people take it for their heart problems. Um, Zoloft and Lexipro and a bunch of other drugs are good for people that have depression and bipolar disorders. Uh, you take too much of it, you're really going to be screwed badly. Um, anything you can think of that can help you in small doses could also kill you. Uh, let, me, let me think of one other thing. Um, well, let's just pick um, Vicodin. You know, Vicodin the painkiller. You know, <coughs> you take a little bit of it, it makes you high, it gets rid of the pain. If you take too much of that, man, it will definitely kill you. So, um, poisons can really be beneficial and they can also kill you. And lip buzzing is a poison. It's not like doing lip slurs and it's not like doing other stuff. It's, I mean, you can do lip slurs all day long if you wanted to, it's not going to kill you. If you lip buzzed all day long, um, you won't be playing for the next week or two. I can guarantee that. So, lip buzzing is a poison, but it's a necessary um, evil to incorporate because it does focus on one thing here. Lip strength. A lot of people confuse all this as amateur. Not true. You really need to, to um, investigate this for yourself, but um, if you happen to see a cadaver and you peel back the skin, and I know it's kind of gross, the tissue fiber here in your lips is different than the amateur, the feather-like muscles that surround your lips, the corners that we all work on real hard, right? The corners. All these muscles here that are real tight. Well, the lip, the, the lip flesh and tissue is different. And so you can actually work on strengthening the lips. And the reason that you want to do that is because the lip muscle in the aperture is the final stage of compression. You have your diaphragm. That's number one. You have the tongue arch and the bottleneck that happens with the tongue arch and the squeeze. Number two. And then you have the aperture, which is the third and final stage of compression. The aperture is just a fancy word for the little hole. That's the aperture right there. The little area where the air comes out and goes into your mouthpiece. That's the aperture. <coughs> Excuse me. Those are the three stages of compression. And you must work on all of those if you want to get a good tone good power and of course good range and endurance. If you fail on one of those you're going to be lacking. And a lot of people tend to fail on the aperture part. Basically what happens is if you don't have a strong lip strength here, when you blow enough air through the mouthpiece, your lips will blow apart. What happens when your lips blow apart? When your lips blow apart you have more air going through the aperture but at a slower velocity. So think about that. Your lips blow apart slightly, it's not exaggerated, but they blow apart enough to slow the air down. You get more air through the aperture and your range goes down. Okay? What happens? You end up cramming the mouthpiece against the horn. I mean, cr sorry, cramming the mouthpiece against your lips. And, um, your lips start swelling, your endurance goes out the window, and you end up having a bad night of playing. So, um, lip buzzing 101. Um, you really need to get involved with lip buzzing. But the thing about it is, it is a poison. So if you lip buzz 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or an hour, like some college professors told me a long time ago, when I was in high school, I couldn't play for a couple of weeks. It screwed me up. I lost range, endurance. It's horrible. It took me years and years and years of experimenting with lip buzzing to find the right mix. So, um, 
I would recommend that you um, check out my website because lip buzzing and several techniques related to lip buzzing actually is incorporated into my 16 week brass upper register course. So the bottom line is you have to be able to lip buzz. Um. <laughs> Almost a double C there. That wasn't warmed up. You have to have the strength in your lips to buzz without the horn to really magnify your range and endurance and really increase the compression that happens in your aperture. So this is Lip Buzzing 101 tutorial. Just basically telling you why in the hows and hopefully that you'll uh, pursue it further. Uh, but last word and I've said it several times and I know it, it's some um, repetitive it is a poison so you go beyond a certain um, time limit with your lip buzzing or buzz too loud and you will make things really really bad for yourself maybe the inability to play for a few days or a couple of weeks so be careful if you want to know about more about lip buzzing and how to incorporate it in your practice yeah, the different very various techniques that you can employ in your practice to help that last stage of compression then go ahead and click on the link you see below you have to click on the description and open it up and you'll see my link there go there and you can email me or simply email me at kurt at trumpet sizzle.com k-u-r-t at trumpet sizzle.com so i hope this video tutorial made a little sense to you if you don't employ lip buzzing at all, I'm convinced you will never gain and master the range on any brass instrument. That I can guarantee. You must master the lip buzzing. I will see you later, my friend. Bye bye. I do. You really need to have more range than what you see on the page in your rehearsal and your ensembles. Well, I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you why that the notes and the highest notes that you have in your ensembles is not where your range needs to be. Your range really needs to be a lot higher than what you have to play in your music. And the reason is, you need to have a cushion of three to four notes. A range above and beyond what you are required to play in your ensembles from orchestral to concertos to lead trumpet to rock and I'm about ready to demonstrate a couple of those right now. Having more range simply allows you to play a wide variety of music without killing yourself. And here's a really awesome piece that I love. I've played before and I plan on playing it again. Concerto in la bemol, or otherwise known as Vivaldi Concerto in A flat for piccolo trumpet. Um, now I don't happen to have a piccolo handy, so I'm going to use my big horn, which means I'm going to be using my piccolo fingers, fingerings on the big horn, because this is a transposition that I'm doing, and of course some of the notes may be a little bit out of tune on the big horn. But I'm just going to go down to one note before, oh, let's see, where are we? Maybe near the very end. Like one note before number three. That's the second line from the bottom of this first move at Allegro. That was a live recording of me now no dubbing no punching out no punching in no nothing and that just gives you an example I did that on my big um, B flat trumpet so classical music requires chops requires range and if your range is an E flat on trumpet or a concert D flat and that's it you won't be able to play this particular piece because you'll be killing yourself with the pressure so that's why we have to have more range than what we really need 
um, when we're looking at a piece of music. You, to play this piece and make it sound good and easy and with a gorgeous tone, you can't have just a concert D-flat range. You really need a concert G-flat or concert um, G, really, to have that big cushion from what you have to play on the page to what you have in your practice room on your face. So that was Antonio Vivaldi, Concerto in A-flat for Piccolo Trumpet. Here we're looking at near the very end of the first movement of the Humble Concerto. And actually, if you play the Humble Concerto on an E-flat trumpet, it's a million times easier. But you will see a lot of people play it on their bighorn. In fact, I'm going to do a little bit right now. Um, some of the stuff that I'm going to be playing goes up to a high C on the B-flat trumpet or concert B-flat. If your range is only a high C or high D, you're going to have a lot of trouble with this piece. And any piece that has high C range, you have no cushion. You're going to be playing on the skin of your teeth. You're going to be using too much mouthpiece pressure. You're probably out of tune. You'll probably miss a lot of notes. You won't have any endurance. It's not going to be fun. That's another reason why you have to have a lot more range than what's called for in a particular piece. I'm starting at, oh, it looks like measure 273. It's the second line down, right near the end of this first movement. And that was just a little excerpt from the very end of the first movement of the Hummel. Went up to high C on my B-flat trumpet. Lord knows if I had a high C or a high D range on trumpet, I would be in serious, seriously big time trouble trying to play this and especially in a live performance. You have to have more range. On a piece like this, you definitely would like to have an F on trumpet. That's a concert E flat above high C at a minimum to be able to go through this and make it sound easy and also for it to be easy for you to play. Here we have a slow rock ballad. It's a second trumpet part, but don't be fooled by that uh, because the second trumpet part here is actually playing the lead part. As you know, Maynard is playing the solo. So don't let the sun go down on me. If you look at the very beginning, it's not really that horrible. In fact, this one never really gets that horrible. Um, for the lead part, which is played by the second trumpet player. But still, you have to have more than the high E flat that you're going to see there on the first line. That was the first line and a note. For the second trumpet part on Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me, and it went up to an E flat, if you can play an E flat in your practice or an E or even an F, you're going to really have a lot of trouble with that line because you need to have at least, at least a double A flat so you can be nailing this without killing yourself and playing on the skin of your teeth. Another example why you need to have more range than what you think. That's a little lick in Birdland right after measure S. And then of course you got the beginning. Hey, we're looking at the first part of the first trumpet part for spinning wheel. And you know, you have two measures of rest. This is a rock piece, obviously rock, funk, whatever you want to call it. And look at the first couple measures for the first trumpet part. You're gonna be in it on a high C sharp. And lordy lordy, if you just have a high C sharp or high D as your max range, you're going to have a lot of trouble playing some of these fun rock and pop charts. 
Uh, there's no question about it. We're not even talking about the super tough, top-tier lead trumpet stuff. Um, um, actually, this does get tough. The spinning wheel Maynard's version does get tough. But I'm just talking about this first line, for example. To put some meat on the bone and have some sizzle, you have to have a lot more than a high C sharp or a high D on your B flat trumpet to be able to play stuff like this. You really do. Otherwise, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to be out of tune. You're going to be wondering why you're using too much mouthpiece pressure. You're going to be having endurance problems. Another reason why you need to have more range than what you actually have to play when you're looking at a piece of music. So I just did that the first couple of measures there just to show that you do have to have more range than just with this, what's on the page, otherwise you're going to run into problems. A demonstration and explanation why you really have to have more range than what you think. It's amazing how many students I get in my course and they'll tell me that they have a high D or a high E flat and when I ask them, well what typically do you have to play in your big band or your rock band or your orchestra or your community Broadway shows, and when they tell me high C's and D's, I just kind of cringe because um, that's tough, folks. To have a high D max range and you're playing up to high D in your ensembles, I mean, that's a recipe for disaster and pain and torture and bad endurance problems, everything. you got to get your range up. I hope that some of the examples I provided, even to you classical players, <laughs> I, I provided an example of the Hummel and also the Valdi Concerto. I mean, it really makes sense. You have to get your range way, way well above what you are required to play in your daily performance and rehearsals. I'm running some very good Black Friday specials that are gonna, gonna conclude um, this evening. I'm gonna try to get this up. Um, if I don't get it up in, up in time, I'll put it up below, look below, and um, I've had a couple people request that I extend it until tomorrow on Monday. So depending on when I get this video up, if it doesn't come up until mid-evening, that doesn't give a lot of people time to react to this particular video. In which case, look down the notes and I might extend it until tomorrow. But really, uh, my programs, I'm cutting some of them almost in half just for this weekend, just to get you involved so you can see what all the buzz is about, why people are getting good results. So TrumpetSizzle.com, I'm Kurt Thompson. And yeah, look down in the description below this video, you're going to see some links where you can click on and start learning how to play first trumpet, lead trumpet, and a rock band, swing band, jazz band, or if you just want to up your game for concertos and pick work. Um, you got to take advantage of these programs now. They will resume at their normal offering price uh, probably late tonight or late Monday night. You'll have to look down in the description to see what I decided to do. Bye-bye for now. So you want to play like Maynard, huh? Yeah, it, you and about you know a million other people do too. So we're going to talk a little bit about the desire to play like Maynard and then the reality. And some people's very close attempts to play and sound like Maynard. And some people's attempts to sound like Maynard thinking that they do, but they really don't. And we're talking about some of, some of Maynard's most famous lead trumpet players. And some of these guys are um, some of the A-list players in L.A. and New York and Chicago. We're going to find out what the difference is. First of all, if you're listening to this and you don't have your range up to a pretty good level, I would stop this video and immediately go to my website, trumpetsizzle.com, and get enrolled in the 16-week upper register program. You're wasting your time. Maynard is about having the the acumen and the facility and the power in the upper register. And if you don't have that, then this video is just a waste of your time. It might motivate you um, to get busy and start working on your range. But frankly, I'm talking to people that either have already developed their range or are thinking about playing lead or they already play lead or they've already even tried to play some Maynard before in rehearsal or at a concert. We're going to be talking about some of the things that cause people to not sound like Maynard. In fact, I guess it was about a year ago, I had some hate, hater idiot that said that you sound like Maynard, but why don't you play your own way? You know, why don't you be yourself? You know, why don't you do your own thing? You know, why are you trying to copy Maynard? 
in my response to this individual, without all the expl explicatives, like F you and mother effer and, you know, all that kind of stuff was pretty much this. Maynard is a style. He's not only an individual and a player, but he created a style. So that would be like asking some organist on Easter morning or in the holiday season, what in the world are you thinking? You know, you're trying to copy, you know, um, Handel. Why? Why don't you just do your own thing? Hey, what are you thinking? You're sounding like Bach. Hey, what are you thinking? That, uh-uh-uh. That symphony, uh-uh-uh. No, it sounds like Beethoven. What are you thinking? Why don't you just play your own way? It's because some of us music, musicians like the style of a particular composer, era, or individual. And we want to play in that style. We want to sound like that. That is a style. So who in their right mind would play Brahms and try to sound like Scott Joplin? Right? Ridiculous. So when we're talking about trying to sound like Maynard, trying to play like Maynard, what we're really saying is we want to play with his style, in the style of Maynard Ferguson. Can anybody ever play like Maynard? Uh-uh. No. <laughs> Even the people that come closest still do not play exactly like Maynard. It's impossible. He was a one of a kind. So no matter how hard you try to copy Maynard, the best that can happen to you is you become better because you have some of the essence of his playing in yours, but you will never be a Maynard clone. Nobody is. Let's get that out of the, out of the way. So when we're trying to play in a particular style, we can call player Maynard Ferguson a style. He had a style, and his style was very smooth, rounded, singable, powerful style, and which is not a lead trumpet style, and that's where the problem is for you folks that already play lead, that already have range. And I'm going to do some demonstrations on what I've heard um, people, and I'm talking about some high powered high caliber people that came from Maynard's band and uh, one of them gets all the gigs in LA it seems like gets all, just about every gig and he's been featured on several Maynard he's never done a Maynard tribute a Maynard tribute means you got to get out there and face the audience uh, in my opinion at least eight songs eight Maynard songs by yourself that's a Maynard tribute by one individual so this particular person I'm talking about has never done a Maynard Ferguson tribute like I have like Eric Miyashiro has like a uh, guy up in New York, Ron Resky has. But this guy is a top dog in L.A. I think we all know who we're talking about, but I'm not going to mention names. He's never done a Maynard Ferguson tribute. Eight songs on a concert, at least. And no stand. If you're going to play in the style of Maynard, you do not use a stand and bury your freaking head in the stand. Hello? <laughs> Are you kindergartners out there? Maynard was not only about his style, but he was about his connection with the audience. I think on some new charts, you might have seen him go over there and glance at his stand, possibly. But on the songs that he knew well, he got right out there in front and wanted to connect with the audience. And being buried in a stand, like you're the studio sight-reading fool that you are. You know who I'm talking about, Mr. L.A. guy. That's not Maynard. Uh-uh. If you have to have your eyes locked on every note on a solo that you've been playing for 20 years by Maynard, that's not Maynard. Okay, you just totally missed it. So, Maynard playing Maynard is in playing a particular style. It doesn't mean that you're going to turn into a Maynard clone. You let me know when you find someone that's turned into a Maynard Ferguson clone that plays exactly like Maynard. I want to find out who that would be because so far that's never happened, ever. So... Now that you know what we're talking about, we're talking about playing in a particular style, the Maynard Ferguson style. We want to play in that style because he set the bar for having this ridiculously melodic, lullaby, cantabile type of sound in the upper register that almost sounded like he was singing on a lot of the charts, right? Yeah. So I'm going to pick out a couple of songs. Um that are well-known, not some of his more obscure ones, but they're well-known and people try to play. And I'm going to try to differentiate on how the style would be correct for Maynard, the Maynard style, and how it would be incorrect if you're playing it as a lead trumpet player. There's a difference. So what? let's see, let's try to find something. And I'm, I have no music in front of me. Look around. I'm in a practice room. 
Um, the only thing I have in front of my stand, I got some Clark, baby. <laughs> so I don't have any Maynard music in front of me. It's going to have to come from my head. I got Herbert L. Clark there, but that's not going to help us out with a Maynard. So we can take what I consider one of his easier charts, and um, this is one that a lot of people can start working on if you haven't worked on Maynard Ferguson and the style, which would be my funny Valentine. Now, we're not going to go through the easy ballad stuff in the beginning. We're trying to capture the part where people really screw up. Not necessarily screw up the notes, as far as missing notes or accuracy, but screw up the style, and they end up sounding like a lead player. So, nearing the end, it's kind of like the push. Um, let me see if I can get my bearings. singable part in my funny valentine near the end that maynard just sounds wonderful on and i've actually gotten pretty close of capturing the main maynard style myself on that particular section and that's when when people actually work with me and learn the maynard we work on that one one of the first ones um it doesn't go too terribly high now i've heard countless lead players and some from maynard's band play it like this Sorry. which is on May 4th, you're going to hear people pop up playing some of the Maynard stuff. I'm confident of it. In fact, I heard there's a big shindig, a big shindig in L.A. with some of the Maynard's alumni. Now, I want you to use this tutorial and listen to what they do. You're going to notice almost all of them, except for probably Eric Miyashiro and maybe one other person, is going to sound like the lead trumpet player trying to play in the Maynard style, not playing the Maynard style. Don't take my word for it. Watch this video right before you see some of these guys play, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And no, they aren't trying to play in their own style or play with their own personality. That, Like, again, that would be like playing Toccata and Fugue in D minor and, and you know, playing it like um, <laughs> you're some kind of jazz piano player, right? Or playing it like um, uh, Barry Manilow, right? Uh-uh. No, when you play in the style of something, you play in that style. You can bring in whatever you want from your own personality, but you play in that style. You don't screw up the style, okay? And you're going to hear these lead trumpet players screw up the Maynard style. They're going to get the high notes, they're going to get the notes, but they're screwing up the style. Just like I did on My, fu my Funny Valentines. So, playing it like a lead player, you smack the notes harder than you normally would, just like you would in lead. mentality. Lead playing the Maynard Ferguson solo. No, you've just totally screwed up the entire style, my lead playing friend. So that's one example about why even people that are the top professional level lead players cannot seem to play like Maynard and play in that style. They're playing like a lead player, right? Lead player. Lots of harsh articulations and pops and um, 
percussive attack to go right along with the rhythm section. No, we're not playing that way when we're playing Maynard. Lead trumpet player. Turn on a light bulb. Think. Let's go on to a harder example now. What would be harder? Okay, a lot of people try to attempt this particular song. And most crash and burn on it, but the ones that actually get through it are not sounding like Maynard. So, again, you know I don't have the music in front of me, and I'm having to do this off the cuff. I'm just trying to get the song in my head. Let me see if I can get it. If you don't recognize that, that's from the big push, um, kind of in the middle of the piece of Danny Boy, um, from way, way, way on back, way, way, way back. I believe that probably was in the 60s, um, or maybe, you know what, it might have even been in, um, could have been the 50s too, when he first started getting that one going. Well, you hear a lot of people trying that one. You can go on YouTube right now and see a lot of people doing that one. Will it sound like I just did? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. So, the lead pr player approach on this one who hasn't thought about the Maynard Ferguson style, which is a style, is going to play it something like this. pretty much all the right notes, didn't I? Yeah, for the most part. But it sucks if you're trying to play it in the Maynard style. That's a lead trumpet style that I just did there. In fact, I could have even overdid it more than what I just did. So the, the singability... style makes the solo not your high notes or how loud you can play or how rough you can attack stuff lead trumpet players out there that's another example Danny Boy listen to everybody playing Danny Boy except for Eric Miyashiro and it's going to sound kind of like I did on the uh, lead trumpet part of my demonstration here okay let's move on to uh, some other ones now MacArthur Park MacArthur Park is the one that everybody tries. This is one that features that top LA trumpet player who's got his, um, <laughs> he looks like this when he's playing. He's in the stand, he's playing like this. He's played this a million times, but he's still got his nose and his horn buried in the stand. Yeah, totally not playing the style of Maynard. And then his playing is not in style of Maynard. People go ooh and ah because he's hitting high notes. I don't go ooh and ah on his playing at all, ever, zero, nada. So, what is he doing that's not in the appropriate style of playing Maynard? Well, let's see what part of MacArthur Park are we going to pick. Um, let's see here. I guess maybe near the front of it. listen to what I just did it's about the same thing right except when you watch some of his live stuff and he's getting a little bit funky um, and sometimes he does when he's when he's doing some of the live stuff like I like the main Ferguson stuff okay so now how would you screw up the Maynard style on that one and make it sound more like a lead trumpet player 
playing that particular song and not playing correctly in the Maynard Ferguson style, you would do it like this. That's a lead trumpet player mentality coming in at a, what could have been a gorgeous, beautiful, singable, melodic solo, and you're pounding it, and you're pounding it, and you're pounding it like a lead trumpet player. Almost like the whole agenda is just to get the high notes popping out loud. You totally screwed it up, Mr. L.A. studio guy from Mandy Ferguson, old-timey man. You screwed it up. How come you can't play it like Maynard? Like I just did. Because you're missing the point and port part of the style. Okay? It's not about playing lead trumpet with the Maynard solo. It's about playing the Maynard Ferguson solo style. Which this person obviously, until now, still hasn't got. Let's go on to another one. Yet another one. So, this one's one that is also very famous. You might even hear it on May 4th when they do the tribute. Let me see if I can remember how it goes. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay. Now, in all fairness, the Gun to Fly Now theme and the Rocky theme does have a little bit more punch, percussive, articulated attacks um, than, say, some of the other ballad solos that uh, we were talking about earlier. So the lead players that are playing this, that were in Maynard's band, can somewhat get away with having that lead player mentality because um, that's just kind of the style, part of the style of this one. But still, there should be a flowing, effortless uh, ness and connectedness with the solo. So how can I make this solo less like Maynard and more like a lead, more like an L.A. top-tier, world-class, A-group lead player? Tell the difference in that it was a choppy, lots of taking air air breaks and stuff like that to make sure you're getting the high notes, as opposed to the nice, smooth, singable style that should be in that particular piece. But like I said before, it is a rock disco piece, so there is going to be more punch to it than the typical Maynard Ferguson style. So that's why the lead players, if you hear this on May 4th, they're going to get away with um, being a little bit more punchy with it and still making it sound close to the style. But by take, throwing in all these air breaks and some of the things that they're doing, it, it, it totally takes away from the style, in my opinion. Okay, so let's see if there's any more Maynard Ferguson things to talk about. Um... But maybe the Gospel John thing, right? Ferguson style. If you're a lead trumpet player playing that, just thinking it's all about the high notes, you're going to end up sounding like this. Okay? That would be a 
typical lead player coming at the Gospel John Maynard Ferguson solo and playing it as though a lead player, lead trumpet player would. Um, is he getting the notes? Pretty much. Is it loud? Yes, that was loud. Is it really in the style of Maynard? No. Maynard would never play, um, he would never play Gospel John like that. That's how a lead trumpet player would approach that solo and not Maynard Ferguson. So anyway, I hope I've turned on the light bulb for you lead trumpet players that have thought about playing Maynard or you already have and then you you look, go back and look and you're thinking there's something missing at, something missing in my performance. Why? I just don't sound like Maynard. I just don't got that style. What's going on? So just forgive yourself because you'll never be Maynard, but you can sound and get the style like Maynard because that's what we're after. Again, if we're going to play um, Fur Elise, da, 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 dee, da, da, right, by Beethoven, we're not going to play it at those would be the right notes, but the wrong freaking style because we're trying to play in the style of Beethoven. And here we're trying to play in the style of Maynard Ferguson. If you're trying to play in the style of Maynard Ferguson, by God, play in the style of Maynard Ferguson and not some lead trumpet player that's chopping it up with a big old hacksaw. Okay, that's my tutorial on playing in the style of Maynard Ferguson and trying to play like him versus just going for the high notes as a professional lead trumpet player and being satisfied and all, all smug with yourself that you got the high notes. Uh-uh. Now you missed it. And then this stand. If you got the stand in front of you and you're playing a Maynard Ferguson tribute or solo and you got your eyes buried in that stand, you have so freaking missed the point of Maynard and the connectedness that Maynard had with his audience. You just totally missed it. Watch on May 4th if there's a tribute concert. Watch how many people that played with Maynard. Bink! Missed it. Missed it. Maynard never came out hunched with his eyes and his horn buried in the stand playing a solo. Never did that. I mean, come on, folks. So if you're trying to play Maynard, rewind this video and watch over and over and over again, and you just might be able to get some of this into your playing and sound better. For those of you who have the range and have some lead but would like to start venturing out playing Maynard Ferguson stuff, I'm telling you, it is the hardest part that you can do on the horn. Playing Maynard Ferguson or, or another written high note solo, whether it be Doc Severinsen or Bill Chase, really doesn't matter. When you are playing the written high note solo, folks, there's nothing else, there's no other harder music for you to play. And I know this for a fact. I got a video I'm going to put up where I made my living playing the Carnival of Venice all summer long, five shows a day. Okay, I've done that. I played all the toughest Empire, Empire Brass and Canadian Brass quintet music. I've done it all. I played all the hardest piccolo pieces, Michael Hyde, Brandenburg, uh, the toughest Vivaldi piece on piccolo. I've warmed up on the Hindemith. I played the Humble and the Haydn. I've done the Tomasi. I played Alan Vizzuti's Cascades. I've done it all. And then I played the hardest lead trumpet parts known to man. What's the hardest thing? None of that. The hardest thing is to stand up, pick up your horn, walk out in front of the band. It's you and the mic or you and the audience. And to play that known written high note solo that everybody knows. So second book, jazz player, there's no finger wiggling your way out of this one, my friends. There's no taking the horn off and listening to the, the rhythm section do a little something while you're resting your chops. Uh -huh. When you play the written high note solo, it's game on. It's you play to the end. You make it or you don't. It is the hardest. I've been it all. It is the hardest. Don't believe me? Let's put you to the test. I'll pick two Maynard Ferguson solos for you. We'll go to a rehearsal big band and we'll make you step out front and play it. Got to play it from memory too. What's the point of burying your nose in the stand? That's not Maynard. Then we'll see what you think. It's tough love, baby, and you need it.
You ever felt stiff? Not in that good way, guys. Come on now, get your mind out of the gutter. Do your lips ever feel stiff, is what I meant to say. You know, you know that you felt better before, the day before, a couple of days before that, but you're playing today and you're just, you're missing a couple of notes and even lip slurs, just normal thing. It happens to everybody. I think it happens to every player on the planet, whether they will admit it or not, even the best players in the world. You know what happened to Maynard, because you can watch some of his live performances where he had, he actually was having some trouble. So yes, um, your lips do get stiff from time to time. You lose your flexibility from time to time. And have you ever noticed that on some mornings and some afternoons you're playing and you got this kind of fuzz and you're airing yourself? And let's just pretend that you're not even a guy that, um, or a gal, that um, cares about playing above high C. And so you're not playing in that extreme register. And But you got this fuzz in yourself. So it's obviously not from playing too high and playing too loud. And it bothers you. It bothers me. Well, I teach my students a plethora of many remedies for this particular situation. And one of them is weird. One of them's crazy. And one of them you just won't believe. You know what this is? Who can tell me what this is? Take a while, I guess. No, no, no. No, it's not that. It's not a shepherd's crook or, you know, a modern shepherd's crook. Um, it's, no, it's not a telescope. Well, kind of. Yeah, it could be a telescope. Um, no, it's not any kind of weapon. Um, maybe you're thinking of it, but you can't spit it out on your tongue. What is this? Still can't get it? This is... A didgeridoo. Didgeridoo. Indigenous to Australia, but you can order the plastic PVC pipe version in many parts of the world. And um, obviously, if you want the real thing with the, the real wood that comes from Australia, carved by the indigenous abor aboriginals from Australia, of course, you're going to pay about a thousand US dollars for it. We're no, we don't need to do that. We're not trying to learn how to play this guy. This is a didgeridoo. We're not going to learn to circular breathe. And we're not going to learn to play this instrument correctly. We are going to use it as a tool to dissipate tension brittleness and stiffness in your lips your chops and to help get rid of that fuzz and extra air that's in your tone that you know is not normally there but on some special occasions it is and usually it tends to be when you've played too much um, or had a gig that went went overboard um, or, you know, there's all, there's other reasons. Maybe you, you didn't have time to divide your practice out and you had to practice two hours at one pop and then get on the plane or something. So there's a lot of reasons why your lips might get stiff and why you might get that air in your tone and why you might find yourself having difficulty doing things that otherwise would be easy for you. That's happened to me in the Clark book. Uh, in case you didn't know, I, I kind of know, you know, my way around the Clark book a little bit. And, uh, but sometimes... Especially after I've done a lot of lead work or a lot of jazz, you know, you do two hours of um, improvisation with the Jamie Abersold stuff, and let me tell you, this is going to about fall off, and it can stiffen you up. And so I have got to the Clark book in the morning, kind of warming up, and I'm going, "What the hell's going on here? I mean, I can't, <laughs> I can't move across the horn easy like I normally can. I'm all stiff." Well, my go-to tool. Now, this is just crazy. You're looking at me and you're going, he's got to be crazy. Well, I am a little bit crazy, but I also am crazy like a fox. This guy, get one. If you got $25 or $30, US dollars in your pocket, or you can 
beg, borrow, or steal it, get one of these guys. You can order offline, from what I've been told from some of my students. Now, I got this um, at a, um, what was it, exotic musical shop in San Francisco in Chinatown, uh, where they have zithers and African congas and congos and you name it, um, maracas and shakers and stuff, and they had some of these. So I got mine for about 50 bucks in San Francisco, but you can order yours online for $25, $30. So um, I'm not pulling your leg on this one. I'm not. I'm being serious. Very serious. A um, little dab on this one a day per do you, will do you. So did I say that right? A little dab per day will do you. That's right. So I, I like to do it one minute, four times a day. Now, some days I don't do it, I don't have the time, but definitely if I feel something sneaking up on me, like my lips are starting to stiffen up, my, I'm playing all of a sudden, where's that air coming from? I will get this guy out and make sure I do it one minute, four times a day. Do not use your normal amateur. So this can work for all brass instruments. If you're a tuba player, baritone, trombone, French horn, cornet, trumpet, doesn't matter, but you can't come at the didgeridoo or this. No. That's going to make things worse, folks. You're coming at this soft, relaxed. Look at that. Lip, relax. Like your lip flapping. Watch. You've seen me enough. That ain't my normal armature, right? No. So, um, pay heed. Do not use your normal armature and don't get goofy and cocky and try to think that you're going to invent some kind of new way to build high notes or arrange by blowing hard on this and use your normal armature. You will destroy your chops. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding you. A lot, you know, some brass players actually, or brass teachers, will actually have you tear down your chops if you have a really screwed up embouchure. And the way they do that, especially for high brass players, is to give you a big tuba mouthpiece or a baritone mouthpiece and just have you buzz on that mouthpiece, totally obliterate your chops and the, the sensation and the feeling of where your normal embouchure was. So you don't want to be playing this guy in any kind of embouchure. We're just doing it. We're getting all the circulation going in there, all the vibrations. We're loosening it up. It's almost like a massage for your face. It's loosening everything up. And you do this for a couple of days, easy. Don't blow it loud. One minute um, times four, spread it out evenly. And you will be amazed. Now, it might take you a day, and it might take you three days, but you don't have to go longer than three days to have your problem of stiffness and air in your tone remedied. And guess what? You got this all for me for free, right? Amazing. But maybe but I gotta do I gotta plug my course, right? You know I do. I gotta plug my course. So you should have thought, wait a minute, how is he coming up with all this stuff? And guess what? There's a ton of stuff like this that's a little bit quirky and wacky that I got in my 16 week course. Stuff you've never even thought about. Stuff that even the masters, Gordon, Caruso, Stevens, Reinhardt, Adam, Clark, and on and on. They didn't think about either. It's in my course. I got some really wacky stuff that works. This is one of them. But now some people do know about the didgeridoo for dissipating tension and stiffness. But... There's a lot of stuff in my course that they don't know about because I'm the one that actually discovered it, invented it, or created a hybrid of two techniques and made a, a unique technique. So, of course, I'm going to plug my course. I'm giving this to you for free to build some goodwill and value. I hope that you can see the value in this right here. It's just amazing. Go out and spend your $30 on a didgeridoo. And um, the next time that you find yourself not feeling quite normal, or playing, you got that fuzz in your sound, or maybe you had to play a big band gig until 1 a.m. at a wedding reception, and uh, things are bad the next day, the next couple days. Get this guy, get it out. Um, yes, you can thank me right now. Here, I'll shake your hand. There you go. You'll be you'll be wanting to thank me when you get this out and it solves your problem in a couple days. Cool. All right. 
about a pound. There we go. Kurt Thompson. You should have my site memorized by now, but it's trumpetsizzle.com. Trumpet Sizzle, all one word. Trumpetsizzle.com. Go there. You're going to be surprised at all the stuff that I got there waiting for you. Tongue Controlled Embouchure, TCE, Spit Buzz, Jerome Callet. And I know I'm leaving out, I think, a couple of German people. Sorry about that, um, German folks. Um, I think there's a very influential um, German trumpet player. Ah, his name is just escaping me right now. He might not have actually taught it, but I think he was employing the, um, the TCE, and he sounded pretty spectacular. I can't think of his name right offhand. Um, I believe the guy I'm thinking of died at an early age of um, early 40s due to alcoholism. But um, he was a pretty good player, and I believe he's associated with the TCE, Tongue Controlled Embouchure. So if the TCE is the Holy Grail to playing brass and trumpet, why isn't everybody doing that? Forget Clogord, forget Stamp, Stamps, Maggio, Reinhardt, Stevens. Adam Caruso, on and on and on. They're just uh, balanced embouchure pops and what, everything else that you've, you've ever heard of. Forget it all. Why, why not do tongue controlled embouchure? The reason is is because uh, the tongue controlled embouchure really doesn't take you through the process, in my opinion. And you need to go through that process. It's kind of a radical different approach to playing a brass instrument that could work for somebody who's tried other possibilities. That's how I'm going to say it. So I don't recommend um, anybody go out and start doing their spit buzz and the tongue controlled embouchure and um, changing their embouchure to that. But I do recommend the tongue controlled embouchure and checking it out if you've tried everything else. I mean this hasn't happened yet, but if you've got if you go through my course and it still didn't kick your butt and make you um, where you wanted to be at physical wise, then tr try the tongue controlled embouchure. But um, I haven't actually had to point anybody in that direction because the people that go through my course go through the process and they come out um, very strong and usually getting what they're after. But I would recommend the TCE if you've tried other things and have failed or fallen flat on. It seems to work for some people. Um, oh, I can't remember the guy's name now. You're really going to hate, hate me on butchering these names. I think Mac, he's even a friend of mine on Facebook. Um, Mac Gallahan. Sorry if I'm not getting that exactly right. Um, I believe he uses that and with um, tremendous success. But again, I don't see it being the holy grail to brass and trumpet playing. I really don't. I've tried tried it myself. I tried switching my amateur over to it. You know, there uses no tongue arch, and the spit buzz, and you're it's kind of weird. You're kind of using part of your tongue as, as um, your your lip. It's just I'm not going to go into it all right now, but it didn't work for me at all, and I don't think it's going to work for most players. But I think it will work, possibly if you've tried everything else. I mean, this is a good last resort routine and technique to get into. So there you have it, the Jerome Callet um, method, if you want to think of it that way. I think he had a video out called Master Super Jobs, and um, otherwise it's tongue controlled amateur. I don't think Jerome Callet invented that. I mean, I believe it was it might have been invented in Germany or over there in Europe. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it on the tongue controlled amateur. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson, and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched, or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh, 
A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. Back to nature with Bill Adam, lead pipe buzzing, advanced trumpet lesson here. Kurt Thompson, and going to expose you to a very, very useful, powerful, and efficient practice technique. And this is actually going to be more doable and more absorbable if you've already been doing the Bill Adams routines and the Bill Adam routine. I always like to pronounce his name with an S. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Bill Adam was the best trumpet teacher at Indiana in Bloomington, bar none. There's no one that's even close to him uh, before or after. And it's just too bad that um, he's not still teaching. And he's, you know, of course he's getting older. Um, in fact, I haven't even checked to see if he's still around, but I hope that he is. Um, anyway, even if he is, I mean, he's just the best teacher at Indiana, and he came up with a lot of cool stuff. And what, I played with a lot of IU guys um, back in the day, and uh, these guys were all good players with huge, big sounds. And I believe that they got that partly from Bill Adam lead pipe buzzing. And we're not going to go into his whole routine because you could actually spend an hour and a half or two hours doing all the Bill Adam lead pipe buzzing. But I tweaked and twisted and manipulated um, my own advanced version of Bill Adam lead pipe buzzing. It's just a little snippet. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be starting on perfect force from second line G to middle C and working our way down. And as you'll soon discover, this is going to be very, very difficult to do unless you have extreme flexibility and power built up in your chops. So G to C. Okay, a little flat. Now I'm pulling out the, the lead pipe or the tuning slide. So I'll be blowing just through the lead pipe. The same thing. So you can see that I'm actually blowing out through here and not through the whole horn. And you probably could tell by the tone quality. Okay, let's work our way down. Now, most of you probably can get that one. That was G to C. How about F sharp to B? Take the lead pipe out. I'll do it like this so you can see what's going on. Okay. You probably are noticing it's getting extremely hard. And it's going to get about impossible in the next one or two for you. It's going to feel that way. So F and B flat. Pull this guy out. F to B flat. Taking a lot of intention and focus on my part to get that out. And now we're going to go to a little fly on my lead pipe. Now we're going to go to E to A. So one and two, bottom of the stop, E to A. Take out this guy. For many of you, that would have been almost impossible. I thought I heard a monkey over there in the trees. You hear that? It is back to nature time with Kurt Thompson, but I didn't know that we got monkey in the trees and uh, chimpanzees. But anyway, uh, if I don't make it, there he goes again. If I don't make it through this video, you'll know what happened to me. I got taken out by a monkey or chimpanzees. 
Okay, now it's going to get really hard. In fact, this gets hard for me. E flat to A flat. Pull this guy out. Boom, center that note. And the last one that we will do will be D to G. And there you have it. You can consider this extremely, extremely advanced. And um, I put this particular technique that I just did to even the best players on the planet. And um, if you just sprung it on them and made them do it right without even had a, having a chance to look at it, um, probably nine or ten out of ten out of them, I don't care who it is, would have difficulty going through this advanced Bill Adam lead pipe buzzing technique. So the physical part of the horn, yes, the high notes, but listen, so many people that can play high have a real shrill, thin sound. And it, so it's not about just being able to play high. If you have a real shrieky, shrill, thin falsetto kind of sound, who cares? There were people that were playing back when Maynard Ferguson uh, was kicking butt when he was a lot younger in the 40s and 50s that could also play high. Well, how come we didn't hear about them and they didn't get that famous? It's because they had that shrieky, thin, falsetto kind of sound that nobody wants to listen to. Maynard's sound was thick and brassy all the way up. That's why. So this is a technique here that will improve your sound. So with whatever range that you have, you're going to have a thicker, fuller, maybe even warmer a type of sound in the upper register. And then all registers, really. Now, if what I just did today on the horn seemed almost impossible to you there's usually just one reason why that would be it's simply a lack of armature strength not really talent here it's a lack of armature strength so you don't need to feel like you don't have the talent you actually got what it takes but you have to have someone show you the right way to do it in the most efficient way to do it so if i perked up your interest and you'd like to learn more about the stuff that I do, which for the last nine years in my um, online programs, is it nine years? Sorry, seven years, has been truly effective for just about anybody that has gone through my courses. It's not a walk in the park. You will pay your dues, you will invest time, and you will invest money. And it will take some hard work and effort, but the results are pretty amazing. And they're long lasting for your life. So. It's something that if you've been thinking about it, you just need to pull the trigger and do it now. Take care of this. Get it handled. I'll see you in the next one. Hey. You won't believe this. One weird trick to solve your dizziness problems. I don't know too many tuba players that get dizzy from blowing high notes it might it might I don't know could be there trombone maybe more but basically it's your lead trumpet players that are playing above high C they get dizzy I'm not going to go into the entire medical delineation of why you're getting dizzy and or maybe not but basically it works like this you have a certain amount of blood in your body right Gravity makes a lot of your blood go down to your lower torso. Now, when you blow hard, you see the veins popping out. What's going on? <coughs> you're blowing, you're spreading the blood away from your brain and your heart. It's going away. Okay. Now, if you happen to have a lot of blood hanging out in your lower extremity, your feet and your ankles and your thighs and your calves. And all the stars line up right, 
you will get dizzy. And in fact, in fact, if you keep blowing high notes, you're going to pass out. Passing out is not a bad thing because basically the body wants you to go prone. It's your body's way of having you you actually pass out to go prone to save yourself. So all the blood can immediately be pumped back to your heart and to your brain. So in case you didn't know why you're getting dizzy, that's what's going on. Now a lot of factors come into play too. Your age, your weight, your height. Chemicals like do you smoke, drink a ton of caffeine or coffee, Red Bulls and things like that, 4-hour energy. Um, your water intake, how hydrated are you? Your stress and your sleep. So these are factors all conspire against you and give you that feeling that you want to pass out. In fact, if you don't acknowledge that feeling, you will pass out. So I used to be afflicted by that when I was... Well, I guess I... Hold, let me go back one more step. Also, if you're playing loudly and for a long period of time near your max range, that will also tend to want to make you pass out. And when I was a younger guy in college, I did notice on some of the lead trumpet charts that I was playing on um, that were top tier back then when I was 19 and 20, I was I would kind of like do this thing, whoa. <laughs> After I got done, I was like, oh my God, I'm just about ready to pass out. Well, the reason for that was because back then at 19 or 20, I think I had a good double A, double B flat, double B, double C max range which is not bad, right? But when you play and butt up against that max range, you're going to probably feel dizzy and pass out because that was my max range and I was playing at it, using the maximum mouthpiece pressure, blowing, and what was going on is um, the, the blood from my brain, my heart was being pressed away. And my heart, no matter how good it was, could not pump blood from my feet and my ankles fast enough back up to my heart and my brain and that's why you get dizzy your body really wants you to be forced to go prone standing up prone so it's not like you're in bad condition is your body wants you to do that saving yourself so one weird trick one weird trick that solves this problem also i forgot to mention other factors like heat I remember I, I drove from Santa Monica to Fullerton to play at Steamer's Jazz Cafe. It was 93 freaking degrees out. And I was stressed out. Drive took me an hour and a half in crappy LA traffic. Why was I stressed out? I hadn't played in a couple of years. Um, I mean, in at that caliber. And I got called in to sub the lead chair. And um, I actually ended up doing pretty good, but um, it was stressful. I had some anxiety. It was hot. Um, I don't know if I was hydrated enough, but I did take one precaution because he said there would be several Maynard charts on there. So here's the one weird trick, folks. Compression socks, baby. They look like women's nylon hose, right? But these guys are medical grade 30, I, I believe it's 30 milligrams of compression. When they go on, they go on really, really tight. There's two of them. On that particular day, just because I knew that I hadn't played, I mean, I played in a couple bands before, but it was easy for me. You know, old timey, white tie. Um, with choppers, ball kind of stuff. I mean, I don't really count that as, for me, playing. I mean, it was okay playing. But this particular band had a lot of pros in it, and they were going to be playing some really tough charts. And I wanted to go there mainly um, to be recorded and be able to put those up on my YouTube channel and other sites, and I've done that. And you can see me playing some different stuff um, on YouTube with that particular group. I think the guy's name was Don Kubik. He's also a friend of mine on Facebook from like four or five years ago. But uh, yeah, um, he runs a big band in the LA area and 
made up of mainly working professional um, LA players. Now, I got called in and play the lead book, baby. Sight read it and nail it down. That's when, you know, the pedal hits the metal, right? And um, because of the temperature, because of my stress, anxiety, because of what I knew was coming for me, I wanted to make sure that I could go through the whole book and um, hopefully my chops would hold up. But if not, I didn't want to pass out. And that's why I was actually wearing these. So that particular day, what I ended up doing is uh, right before I got in, got in the car and got in that hour and a half of traffic from Santa Monica to Steamers um, Jazz Cafe in Fullerton, which is Orange County, I got on my bed and I put my legs up on the wall like this. So if you can imagine me, I'm laying down and my, my heels are hitting the wall like that and I'm letting all the blood drain back down to my torso. And after about 15 minutes, because of, due to gravity, that's when I put these guys on. And that's when I, you know, dress with my black pants and my attire for playing. So what this does, it grips and is so tight that it does not allow a lot of blood flow back to your lower extremities. And it enables your heart to keep um, pumping blood at a closer rate and a closer distance from where your heart is and where your brain is. And as a result of that, that is the one weird trick my brass plane friends, get yourself some compression socks. Now they make all kinds. They make um, sock. It looks like socks, like ankle socks, socks that go to your calves. These are actually thigh high. They go up to your mid thigh, and they actually make compression pants that go up to your waist. And I first got turned on to this by Ultra marathon and triathlete competitors believe it or not if you see them wearing all like an all black tights when they're running now that costs a lot more than this but those are compression tights and so what that does is it gives them a lot better endurance their part is not working so hard to pump blood from their feet back up here because those compression tights from their ankles all the way up to their waist is forcing the blood to stay more in their mid torso and so I got turned on to this idea that if that works that way, what would it do for people who have a tendency to pass out? So um, there's no site um, out there telling you that this is working for the trumpet players and trombone players that are playing extreme high lead stuff and getting dizzy. You heard it here. Let me toot my horn on that one. You heard it here right now. I'm the one that discovered that. It's a quirky idea, it's a quirky, weird tip and trick and technique, but it works. And you know what I'm talking about. If you get dizzy, it's a horrible, impotent feeling, isn't it? Impotent. You got the chops to blaze away on that note, but dang it, you can't because you're going to do this. And that's a very impotent feeling. To know that you got this, and you got this, but you can't do it that much because you're going to go, boom, you're going to fall out. Now, with this one weird trick, and it is weird, baby, compression hose, compression socks. Get them online, because when I first checked this out, I bought them at CVS. Man, it was like 80 bucks for these. I returned them when I found out I can get them online for about a third. These were about 28 bucks. So, yeah, you can go to CVS or Walgreens or Walmart or whatnot, and you're going to pay about, it, it is expensive, you're going to pay about 70 or 80 bucks for thigh-high 30 milligram compression medical grade socks. Don't do that. Save your bucks, go online, order them, the same damn thing. And just wait a little bit, and you're going to save yourself 50 bucks. You might as well put that $50 in. Um, buy a nice trumpet lesson for me. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be better use of your money than giving it to Walgreens. You got to give it to starving and low income teachers, right? Um, you got to give something back. There you go. So try it.
if you're a lead trumpet player or you're just a guy playing around but you can't have that much fun playing because you're getting dizzy try this one weird trick and prove me wrong you won't be able to this is the real deal compression medical grade socks these are 30 milligrams they come in all ratings from I think as low as 15 milligrams up to 50 uh, I would recommend somewhere in the 25 or 30 milligram range 50 is for people that have had vein surgery and people that really have a horrible horrible problem with let's see if I can remember what the term is Vasyl. No, I'm not gonna remember what it is it's a um, dang it I wish I could remember that name of that term um, it's a syncope disease that affects some Americans and some people in the world where they they're always getting dizzy they're not playing trumpet they're they're getting dizzy when they stand up when they go off from bed and they stand up they're really getting dizzy and they do they really do have this medical condition oh I just thought of it it's vasyl vagal syncope vasyl vagal syncope that's when your heart is not able to pump up blood from your lower extremities quick enough and you're getting dizzy all the time not because of trumpet or trombone but for us we're not concerned about that and I'm not a medical doctor it's a weird trick go spend thirty dollars forty dollars on some medical grade compression socks and you're going to be amazed that when you go out to your gig or your rehearsal you can blow your brains out and you will not pass out Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. Hey, I'm here gonna talk about tongue arch a little bit simply because although I've tried to explain it before even demonstrate it before people still have trouble actually doing it now a lot of people think that they're doing tongue arch this is for all brass players really um, tongue arch as you probably should know is a second stage of compression diaphragm first tongue arch in the bottleneck at the throat second and your aperture and your ability to keep your aperture narrow is the third stage of compression but it's that second stage of compression which is really important in the the, the the problematic area for most brass players a lot of you think you're doing it but you're not I can instantly recognize I don't even need to hear you in the same room and that's why I'm so effective teaching on phone and by Skype I can hear when someone is not doing tongue arch because they have this strained for sound that does not come with the tongue arch it comes when you're not doing the tongue arch you got the tongue arch it's free and it's effortless you can just tell there's a different kind of quality to the sound i'm going to try to get down and dirty in my mouth i think you can see it it's not going to be pleasant but some of you got to realize what's going on when i talk about roll in and roll out a lot of people don't get that um, i'm not sure why that is so first of all, first off, um, you need to understand the concept of roll out and roll in. Roll out, roll in. 
okay? When you are going higher, eventually, when you really get an expertise at the upper register, you can do both of this in real time. And you can do it in the form of a glissando. Um, here's like low A. I'm not warmed up, folks, so pardon me here. Look at that's kind of a rolled out, isn't it? More rolling, right? Even more rolling. Awesome rolling, okay? So I went from here. Sorry, it's flat. Not much rolling. In real time. A little bit sloppy. That's real time rolling, folks. To be able to do what I just did, you have to be able to roll your lips in and roll them out in real time. Now, for those of you who haven't um, graduated to that level and actually um, it's very, very difficult. Um, I have to say that um, I don't meet too many people that can do that. It's just difficult. So your second best way to do it would be to already have the roll in in place. Okay. So when you're wanting to play higher, or if you have to start a higher passage, you need to already be rolled in. You can't start above the staff um, with a roll out. It's just going to have that strain sound. Even with my tongue arch. Let's roll out. Recognize that sound? I certainly do. Because I hear it in a lot of people that I teach. And most of the time when they get done with me, they don't make that sound anymore. Because they've learned proper tongue arch and roll in. So you can't start a passage. Let's go back real quick. Ultimately, you want to be able to do what I just did. Roll in and roll out in real time. Okay? That's ultimately. But during the interim, while you're still getting this down, you at least got a roll in when you're starting a higher passage. So you can't start above the staff with a roll out. You got to start with a roll in. Roll them in. That's rolling, folks. Seems like a lot of people don't get that. Um, I hardly ever get on the forums anymore for obvious reasons, but when I've gotten on there, it seems like every every other topic is about roll in and roll out. So people are still having tons and tons of problems with roll in and roll out. So get the roll in down. Now, when you get the roll in down, you roll in your lips as much as possible, and you're trying to put as much lip tissue into the mouthpiece as possible to play higher. So I'm rolling in. Let's say I want to go, let's just like ridiculously higher. I got to really roll in. I am a dry lip player by the way, but sorry. I'm just trying to get my roll in without scraping up my lips too much. Roll in. Now put, now I'm going to put some pressure and put as much lips in the mouthpiece as I can. Actually, that wasn't too horribly difficult for me. I'm not really warmed up. It's almost impossible to play too um, low or even low at all with the roll in as extreme as I was doing. Watch. I mean, even that high C felt low to me. So roll in extreme. I mean, I'm having trouble getting the high C out practically because I've rolled in so much and I got so much lip tissue that it really narrows down the aperture. Now I'll roll out a little bit. A little bit more. So 
for me, I actually had to roll out considerably to accommodate the high C, probably because I'm used to playing so much past that. And for you, you're going to have to feel where you are on the instrument. You have to get the roll in, folks. It has to be there. Learn it, do it, use it. Now, if you got the roll in without the tongue arch, remember in the beginning I was doing the roll out on the high A, but with the tongue arch. What happens if you have the roll in with no tongue arch? Other people sound like this. So you got the roll in part down, but they don't have a tongue arch. So it sounds like this. Roll in. Again, the hallmark of somebody who is not doing the tongue arch properly is a very forced and strained sound. And of course, you don't really have a lot of good range if you're not doing the tongue arch at all. So, hope you recognize that sound. If you hear that in your own sound, you need to start uh, paying attention here and get with the program. Get that tongue arch down and get the roll in. So, roll in, or roll in, but no tongue arch. Listen to the difference when I go higher. Okay, roll in. Draw my tongue. Sounds like crap, doesn't it? It's got that forced, strained, quivering, wavering tone uh, that people get when they're not using tongue arch. So put the tongue arch back on, and I don't know if you can tell this, but I'm one arming this myself, which is not easy um, to play and do this at the same time. But I'm actually holding the camera. Put tongue arch. Notes lock in. In fact, that almost hurt my ears, folks. That was louder than, okay? <laughs> wow. So, um, and I was one one arm banded on that um, double A scale, right? So, now let's go back to what's going on inside your mouth. Low C positioning. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, there you go. You can see my tongue. Ah. Uh, so, for low C. Ah. Uh, I'm going to freeze my tongue when I get done playing with no tongue arch. Low C. Notice there's hardly any rolling. It's just more of a roll out. That's where my tongue was. Flat with that kind of dip into it. Let's see what happens if you do the tongue arch. Now the tongue arch should be with your tip of your tongue, right there, behind your teeth, here. Okay, now you got the first part of the tongue arch. Now the tongue arches up. That is your tongue arch when your teeth are shut. Okay, it's not here. Some people are doing all kinds of wacky crap and it's not going to help you. In fact, I don't even know how some people can do it. Your tongue arch is not just arching up like that. I don't even know how you can play if you're doing that, but some people are arching it up, but they still sound pretty bad. And the reason is you have to have your tongue anchored. The tongue can be anchored at the top of the bottom teeth. Here's the, the bottom teeth, obviously, near the top. Right there. Or down lower. I'm right down almost at the gum line. You getting this, folks? Oh, ah. Uh, why are we doing this? Because no air is coming around the size of your tongue 
the only the air can come up and over the tongue and come down and come out your aperture. That's why just building lip strength and chops is not to be all into all to everything because you have to have this air sped up at the second stage of compression. The air is coming up here. Now you've already got the first stage, uh, stage down. We're not going to talk about that right now with the diaphragm. But basically it's, it's a bottled up high compressed air. So that's diaphragm. The air is coming up through your throat. It comes in and immediately it should meet the resistance of your tongue. Resistance meaning you reduce the space in your mouth. Ah, E. Now it has to travel up and down. And when it comes down, it comes down right there. It comes out your aperture. You got to get that, folks. If you don't get that, you can actually go through my four-month program and build up chops of steel. And yes, have gain in range and endurance. But you're, you haven't hit that sweet spot. You're still going to be struggling with mouthpiece pressure. Even though you've, you have strengthened all this up, you have strengthened up a lot of things um, during my course. Or if you take somebody else's course. But if you don't get the tongue arch, you're really missing that sweet spot that um, a lot of people that excel in the upper register are enjoying. It just makes life a lot easier and more efficient. So you got to get that down. You need to invest whatever time it takes for you to get the feel down for yourself. Ah, uh, that's low C for me. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, 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 Now, when I go above high C, my tongue arch is so high that it's rubbing against the roof of my mouth and almost stopping the bulk of air to come through. I mean, I'm really blowing hard to meet, not because the note's um, hard or high, because it's meeting a tremendous amount of resistance um, inside my mouth. Once I meet that resistance, the air spins out so fast, and then you see what happens with the roll-in. Everything links and syncs up to be able to get those high notes out with the least amount of effort and the most amount of efficiency. So, again, low C. I'll freeze it. That's where my tongue was, and you saw where my lips were pretty much a rollout. Tongue still low, but it is higher than it was with the low C, and my jaw is up. Low C, the middle C is more up. So I think your jaw dropping down when you go lower. I'm exaggerating. Up, and it goes up as high as you can get it when you're really going into the upper register and the extreme upper register. So high C. Hey, you see the beginning of my tongue arch? So I didn't even have a full tongue arch for my high C. Don't need it. I guess I'm just a little bit lucky. I just don't need it after doing it for all these years because I also have this to rely on. And also I also have a lot of hot air. I think people know that one, right? So that's even when I'm not playing the horn. Now let's go a little bit higher. Um, roll in. Oh yeah, tongue arch was up there, way up there, and almost probably at the max, but not quite, because my max starts to get, uh, my, my tongue really, I can feel the brunt impact of it when, uh, for me, when I'm going to my highest notes. Ah, got the B out, not the double, not the triple C. Once I'm at, for me, uh, triple A, triple B, and triple C, 
my tongue is like it's just shaking it's just grinding as hard as it can to to lift up and close off the air at the roof because it's trying to make just a little pinprick of a space for the air to come through extremely fast and then come down and then after that it's up for my lips to be able to continue grip into the mouthpiece and hold that narrow aperture as soon as you have a millimeter flinch where your lips can't do that all of a sudden you, you drop you could drop a fifth when you're up that high so I hope this video helped explain what most of you think you are doing but you're not tongue arch just like diaphragm is not theoretical it's something that you really employ you really employ so tongue arch Take a good look. Roll in. Tongue arch. It's not pleasant to look at, but so many people have problems with that uh, you just need a little tough, unpleasant love in this video. So we talked about roll in, roll out. I got up close and personal. Roll in, sorry, roll out, roll in, roll out, roll in. You need to understand that concept and you actually need to, need to be able to apply it. That means really do it. Not something you're thinking about. You are really doing the roll in and roll out. You are really doing the tongue arch and then flattening the tongue back out when you go lower. You are really moving your jaw up and down depending on what register you're playing in these are things you're really doing and if you're not really doing but you're just thinking about them you really are having problems and you're not sounding the way that you likely could so this is all about technique and feel it's like riding a bike there's a technique to it but also there's a feel that you gotta learn right so technique and feel this is not about um, lifting weights and getting stronger and making your chops stronger this is all about applying technique to what you've actually done the conditioning of your armature and your lips you apply this technique to it and it's just you're going to have that wow experience so now for those of you who thought that you could just watch this video and sail on into the silvery seas uh, with no more problems no uh, upper register and endurance is the most challenging technique on the instrument bar none bar none so um, I gave you some really good advice on this one to help you but you still need to get involved in a process so many people when I say so many people it just gets ridiculous I mean every time I log on to Facebook can you help me with the high note tip can you help me with this can you show me this I mean well first of all it's my job you know and uh, people sometimes pay me for doing that but second of all no I can't just show you a quick little tip because one quick little tip is not going to help you attain your goals and the reason is because most people don't understand improving your upper register and endurance is a process that you must go through it is a process that you must go through and you need to have somebody show you the correct process and the right timeline to accommodate your goals and a couple of um, techniques a routine from some guru uh, meaning one technique from one from one routine or some tips and tricks just ain't gonna cut it you're just not going to get what you want so um, I've shown you some pretty good techniques here which is a part of it but you have there's no shortcuts you have to go through the process you got it my friends I hope you do and I hope this helped. Bye for now. It's Kurt Thompson. And you haven't forgotten my website, have you? TrumpetSizzle.com
Hey, it's about time we had a discussion about air and aperture strength again. And over and over and over, when I get um, a consultation on the phone and people are going on and on about their air and they're having trouble with their air, I try to remind them that air is just really not the major deal that so many university instructors make it out to be, and I'm about ready to prove it right now. Okay? So I want you to watch carefully to my breathing and to my exhaling. I'm not even going to try to take a normal full breath. I'm just going to take a full breath and that means when I say a normal full breath for me that would involve throwing my tummy out to make the diaphragm drop down and pull more air into my um, lungs and I'm not even going to do that. So what I'm going to do is try to get close enough so you can hear my breathing and what I'm going to do is I'm going to exhale some air and still play and still play high. You ready? Okay, so I'm going to take a full um, full tank of air, try to figure out what note would be best to play here. Well, we could do a couple different notes. Let's just try the note that almost everybody can get right high C. Just about everybody can get that, not everybody, but it's a common note. So high C, let me work my way up to it. Right there is about forte, really, folks. So I'm going to take a big breath. It's almost fortissimo. Now I'm going to take a breath, but before I play it, watch. I'm going to let about 25% of the air escape from my lungs. you got to pay careful attention. I'm going to let the air out, freeze it, and play. So basically what you're looking for is less air, but I'm still playing the same intensity. Here we go. So, full breath. I let it out. <laughs> Loud, powerful, full. Now let about 25% of the air out, okay? Let's say I really was horrible at breathing and taking in the right amount of air and using the proper breath for our instrument. Let me let out 50% of it. 50%. So here we go, same thing, but listen for the hiss and listen for no inhale. There's going to be no inhale. I'll take a full breath, I'm going to let out 50%, freeze, and play. That's what you're listening for. You're not going to hear me inhale because I'm going to be playing. Here we go. I don't have much air left. I think I actually let too much air out that time. Still, a significant loud round high C. If you were in the room, you probably have to plug your ears. It's pretty loud. Let's go crazy. How about I let almost all the air out of my lungs? Let's say 75%. And when I get done playing, you're gonna I'm gonna finish exhaling so you can realize how much or how little air is left in my lungs. So here we go. It's all about air. You gotta listen to it. Big breath. Not much air left. Not much air left. That was probably down. I probably let about 80% of my air supply out or maybe even 85%. Can you see that? Or this? Think. Think, folks. Just because he or she has a PhD doesn't mean anything. It means they were good at taking tests. They're good at doing this, doing this, and doing this. You gotta think smart. Get your advice from somebody who knows what they're doing. Let's why don't we take it up to a more advanced level because I feel like high C is doable for, by most people. Uh, let's take it all the way up to past, right past upper register. And who knows what that means? Upper register is high C to double G. Uh, let's take it out, no argument, it's the high C to double G. You go past double G, you're going into extreme upper register plane. Let's do 
Um, one of the first couple notes you come to outside of upper register, and I'm talking for trumpet, this would be a concert G and R double A. Why is it double A? Because low A is here. Low A. Below the staff, low A. Middle A. Second line A in the staff. High A is right above the staff. Now if we double that, we come up with double high A. It seems that there's an argument on whether that's high A. It's double high A. Hello? We're not playing piano, folks. Are we playing piano? I don't care about piano. I care about this. I don't care if it's a transposing instrument either. We're playing this instrument. That's a low A. Middle A, high A, and double high A. Okay, we got that straight so far? University professors out there, get it? All right, good. Now, same trick. It's not really a trick, it's just a feat of embouchure strength. What really is going on here is embouchure strength, folks. I don't care how much you breathe, really. I mean, breathing is part of the compression, and I will advocate that in our course, but if you have one lung and asthma, you can still play lead trumpet. You can still play piccolo trumpet. You can still do the Maurice Andre stuff. Don't let anybody fool you and tell you otherwise. It's not your air. It's this. You don't got this. You're screwed. Let's do the same test on the double A. Full breath. A little tester note. That was um, definitely fortissimo bordering on three Fs right there. Now you're going to watch me exhale. Listen carefully. I'm going to take a full breath, exhale about 25%, and then play. I'm not going to be able to take another breath. Listen carefully. It's all uncut and unedited. Big, full, piercing round. That would have cut through just about most big bands. Guaranteed. Okay, let's up the ante. I'm going to let out 50% of my air. If I let out 50% of my air, folks, I'd be down to probably the, the physical attributes of a 6th or 7th grader um, playing this instrument. Because I am an adult male and I ha have um, a large body and big lungs. But if I let out 50% of the air in my lungs... I'd be down to a 6th or 7th grader as far as anatomy goes, physical anatomy. Here we go. Listen for the exhale and listen for nothing after but me playing. So there's no more inhale after that. Okay. That was half a tank of air, baby. How can I do that? It's not magic. This. Don't rationalize the way other people, especially instructors, will have you rationalize. You don't got range because you're not breathing correctly. I'm breathing about as unfreaking uncorrectly as somebody could right now and still blistering, peeling paint with my double A. Let's go crazy. And I'm going to let out just about almost all my air and see if I can still squeeze out that double A. Pay careful attention and listen. You might want to have your headphones on and put this on speakers. You need to listen that once I exhale, there's no sound. There's no sound of me sneaking air in. I'm down on air in my lungs. Not much. Let's try it again. Double A one more time, but this time with only about 25% of my air capacity. Is the light bulb turning on inside your head for some of you? It better be. <laughs> it better be.
You can practice breathing exercises and stand on your head, run marathons, do yoga, until you've taken 10 years off your age, you still are not going to be able to master this instrument and this part of it and the chops and the power until you do what it takes to get the strength here. Go out and run your marathon and go swim three miles. Go bike 110 miles. You're not going to be able to do what I just did. You're going to have to work on this and this. You're going to have to get tough. You're going to have to do some real work on your embouchure and also smart work. Quit listening to people with advanced degrees that can't play worth crap. Yeah, they do the same stuff over and over again, don't they? The Hummel and the Haydn and the Brandenburg and the blah blah and the blah blah. I did that stuff when I was in high school. Quit listening to them. Almost everybody can do that stuff. Pay attention to someone who can do and play how most people cannot. That's who you want to listen to. I'm Kurt Thompson. You already know my site, trumpetsizzle.com. Go get you some right now. Kurt Thompson here, debunking more myths. And the air myth, the air myth, a um, couple of gurus in the past are really known for um, talking about the air, airflow, moving the air. And um, I buy into some of that, really do, um, for especially playing in the low register and the middle register. Quantity of this air that they're talking about, you know, really breathing from the diaphragm and then all the way up and letting the air come out and help you sing up in the upper register. That is a myth, folks. And let's let's talk about the physics so you can understand when your university professor tells you it's all about the air. I actually had a French horn, Dr. Olson from Austin P State University. I remember when I was trying to get past upper register in college first couple of years and get into the extreme upper register so I could do some of the Maynard. Um, my trumpet professor there, who was a, who was a great uh, trumpet guy, um, he didn't really have that much of an upper register, and at least in my opinion. And so I, talked, I took a couple lessons with Dr. Olson, who was all about air. 
he told me the reason that I couldn't play in the extreme upper register of the instrument is because of my lack of air. And I really needed to work on airflow. And um, anyway, I did a lot of his exercise. He was a French horn in, in, um, faculty member, tenured at Austin Peay State University, Dr. Olson. Ken Olson, I think is his name. And uh, I remember working on some of his techniques for a couple of weeks and I got worse because I was trying to do the, the technique of using a lot of air and just no pressure here and no strain. So don't, don't even tense up at all. No muscle power here, no nothing, no lip, it's just all air. Well, as a kid, of course I was trusting him since he was supposedly the expert. Now that I am in the position where I'm at now, I know he totally was talking out his ass. He didn't know what he was talking about. Physics, this is your lips, obviously, and your embouchure set, and you're going to have a little bit of a hole that will form. See, it's like a crack. It's not really a hole, but we call it the aperture. Now, folks, use your noggin on this one. If I blow a tremendous amount of air, breathing from my diaphragm, let's take that correct breath, stomach out. You see it, my lips open up, watch it again. My lips are opening up significantly. Why are they doing that? The tremendous amount of quantity of air and the speed of air is causing my lips to blow out just from the sheer force and the sheer quantity of air coming out. My lips can't contain it all. Now, if you're really thinking about this and you know that you need the most narrow aperture possible to jettison out fast air vibrations for um, the upper register on any brass instrument, what does that tell you? That tells you that the more quantity of air you try to blow out, especially if this is not strong, you're going to have a limited upper register. Now, even if this is strong, mine's pretty decently strong. It's the physics. I can't blow as much air out as a lot of these college professors and your own private instructor might be telling you to. Um, and I got a pretty strong armature, and I can't hold all that air. Can't do it. What happens if you don't have a very good strong armature like I do? Well, then you're even. You got like two, two strikes against you right there. So, we have to use our noggin on this one and realize that it's the compressed air, not the quantity. And that's what, you don't really hear that from um, university uh, music faculty, compressed air. You hear air, air flow. It's all about the air. Diaphragmatic breathing, that's what you hear, but you don't hear compressed air, so they're confusing a lot of people. The reason is because they can't do it themselves. They don't know what's going on, okay? so. You're going to have to back off on some of the high notes and just let the compressed air do the work. So if I take a big breath, let's see what we got here. That was a concert E flat F. I blew some decent air through the horn, but it was mainly compressed air. I wasn't trying to bl overblow and blow my lips out. Now, if I try to go more, <laughs> I'm really shoving a tremendous amount of air through the horn, and I start to notice my tone quality goes out the window. The note chips a little bit and dances around. The reason is I'm fighting to contain this narrow aperture with the strength of my chops, and all that air is just blowing my lips out. Remember, as soon as your aperture of widens even slightly, we're talking about a millimeter, your range drops. Listen to that again. As soon as this, as soon as you cannot contain the narrow aperture here, and if we're talking about micromillimeters, a millimeter, just a fraction, your range drops. Boom. That's how tight the clearance is right there. So if you're trying to blow, fill up a blow, this huge amount of air in the upper register, you're actually fighting the wrong fight you're making things really hard on yourself now if you're trying to play in the, the middle register middle right now look at 
my aperture. Fruge. Earn right there. For a middle C. Way, that's like a million times wider than I would use for um, above high C. So because my aperture is already wider, and of course I got my low C tongue position, there's no compression going on there really, except for the natural compression from the diaphragm and maybe the bottleneck in your throat, but there's no tongue arch. Other than that, there's not really any compression. So I am able to blow, that. that is where the university professors are correct when it comes to your air. So when you're in the middle or lower register, they are correct about that. Then you need, then it is a, a lot about air uh, more than anything else. So if you can think of, in tr terms of trumpet speak, um, let's say the, the middle of the staff, you know, middle C, which is third space C in the treble clef staff, maybe D, maybe E, but now you're getting to, uh, to the top of the staff, but right around there, C, D, E, and down, now all that air that you, air advice you've been getting from your instructors and your college instructors and your university professors, that is good advice. That is good advice. Because you do need to have um, worked on a lot of air and breathing techniques for that. But it's counterintuitive. I know it seems counterintuitive that you need a lot more air and have to huff and puff, but you're actually working against yourself as you go higher. You actually have to use less quantity of air So on a high C, what if I take in less air? Here's a full breath. What if I take in half a breath for the high C? I actually get a lot more vibrancy and brass it is to my tone and I'm not overblowing it and it's not going to gas out my chops that's a high C so that's the beginning of upper register ooh that's a very very narrow aperture for a high concert D which would be high E on trumpet Barely, barely any space in the aperture for that to come out. That was a double high G. And of course, we all know what a double high G is, right, university professors? You got your high G that sits right on top of the staff. And if you double that an octave higher, you got your double high G. See, uh, fortunately, a lot of them don't get that part right either. So that's actually a double high G. A high G is the G, the little G that sits very, right on top of the staff, the treble clef staff. So, know your notes on trumpet, folks. Uh, the next one. Let's see, where are we at? Okay, here we go. There was probably a pinhole of a space in my aperture for that, what should have been a double C. Let's double check it. Yeah. Try it again. Hardly any of any aperture there at all. Barely. Like maybe not maybe not even a pinhole for that double C to come out. And I wasn't using that much air. So as you go higher, you can get away without using much air. Now I'm not really warmed up for the high notes here, but if I don't want to take that, you saw me take a big breath before. That's a big breath for me. You can't tell, but I am breathing. My stomach's going out first, and then my chest is rising, and I lift up my shoulders a little bit more to get more to allow my lungs to expand even more, and then I come back down. That's where you get. That's where I get part of my compression. So, the, oh yeah. So the people who tell you don't raise your shoulders when you're taking a breath, they obviously don't play in the upper register, or if they do, they suck at it. Watch any of the, the heavyweight upper register experts like Maynard Ferguson 
Um, I've even seen a couple of video clips of Bud Brisboy. But well, Bud Brisboy developed the original Bud Brisboy wedge breath. It wasn't Bobby Shue. Check it out. But as Bud is a lot older or than Bobby Shue. Of course, he's passed away now. But uh, Bud developed the wedge breath, and of course, that involves taking as much air, swallowing the air, and then bringing your shoulders up, and then coming down. That's where you get the pressure. So these, I hate to keep you know beating up on the people that really can't play that high but they they're good test takers you know they got the dma right so they're good test takers and they, they know how to play the game but they most of their technique is doesn't make any sense so when they tell you to keep your shoulders down you know when you're playing and you're supposed to take a big breath how can you actually take a big breath with your arms and your shoulder your arms and your shoulders down locking your lungs in where you you can't even expand your ribcage anyway I feel sorry for some of these people so anyway, what if you, now you know my big breath, the point where I'm going with this is I don't want to take a big breath. What if I take even less air? So how about 25% air? Okay, so I'm letting all the air out. Now I only had 25% of a take of air in my lungs. You heard at the very, very end of that, I put a little meat on the bone on that double C. Um, you probably can't tell because I'm recording this on my uh, phone camera, but it got up to about a forte. It wasn't a bury the band double C, but it was about a forte. That was on 25% tank of air for me. Now, I would probably want to take another 25% more to at least have a half a tank. But there's no way in heck I'm going to try to shove the largest quantity of air that I have in my lungs through this horn for a double C. I probably would overblow, but probably nothing would come out. So anyway, that's your lesson. And this is a real logical lesson based on physics. And unfortunately, for a lot of brass players, you don't get a logical lesson based on physics. You get a illogical lesson based on passed down theories that don't have any merit. Usually they're passed down theories in academia because the DMA that's teaching you, well, that's what they learned from their DMA and that's what they learned from their DMA and on and on and on. Good test takers? Yes. Yes. Got a good memory for regurgitating all those facts? Yes, they do. Are they the best players in the world? Almost certainly not. No. And they're not always the best teachers either. Go back and rewind this video. It should make a lot of sense to you. And if it does, you know what to do, baby. Send me an email. Kurt at trumpetsizzle.com or just go to my site. You're going to get the real deal at my site. I don't have to kiss any department chairman's butt to be able to say what I'm doing. And I don't have to kiss any contractor's ass either and worry about whether or not I'm going to get a gig. I make my own gigs. I am the contractor. So I say what I want and I say the real truth here for everybody. I don't have to count out anybody. And if you like that frank, honest, brutal, in-your-face truth, you'll like working with me and you'll actually like getting results. Until next time. Mark Losandos. And if you're not doing those, you're leaving a big chunk out of the apple when it comes to improving your overall trumpet playing, flexibility, range, all range, low range, mid range, high range, facility on the instrument. Here, check out some fun stuff when it comes to glissandos on the trumpet. Hope you enjoy it.
that he actually had some decent high notes in his back pocket, but they didn't last very long at all uh, when he went to play in his band. And he really wanted to know how the 16-week upper register course could help out with that if it mainly focused on higher notes. And that's when I told him, I said, well, <laughs> endurance is a byproduct of your range. Okay, so if you want better endurance, you just simply have to increase your range. That's, that's what you got to do. It also goes hand in hand with being able to have more duration on your chop. So um, let's just give you a quick weird example. Let's just say that you are a trumpet player and you've done very well for yourself and you can just honk out really, really loudly and beautifully a double G, which is the top note in upper register before we go into extreme. Okay, but let's just say that you only practice 10 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day. Okay, now typically what I would tell people is take your max range in your practice at home and come down about four or five notes and that's going to be the range where you actually have the best endurance in a rehearsal or a performance or a solo. So if he had that double G and he came down to high C for example, that would be the perfect playing range for him. Now based, and also for endurance. Now based on what I just said, well you might think, well then he's going to have tons and tons of endurance. No, 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 no. Remember I just said this guy is practicing 10 or 15 minutes a day tops. Maybe he's a busy professional or maybe he's an MD and just doesn't have time to practice. But he does 10 or 15 minutes a day to maintain his double G, a little warm up. He goes up, hits the G and a couple other things and then he's done. This individual is not going to fare too well even if he takes my advice with that correlation of four or five notes below your, your highest notes at home or in your practice studio. Simply because he doesn't have enough time, doesn't have enough of metal on his mouth outside rehearsals and performances. So even though he has the, de the desired ratio of four or five notes below, that's the music he's playing, up, goes up to about a high C, maybe a high D, that would be perfect for this individual except for the fact he doesn't really practice that much. So you have to have both parts of the equation. Now, here's where most people have a problem. Most people get the second part of the equation, okay? So most people are practicing, if they got an hour and a half rehearsal that they know they gotta go to, on average, these people are practicing an hour to an hour and a half a day, sometimes two hours a day, thinking that by practicing that much every day, they will actually be able to go through an entire rehearsal um, or a performance. No, because they didn't get the other part of the equation. The other part of the equation is the range. So let's just give an example of someone playing at a community big band. Maybe at your community college, maybe you meet at a church, or maybe it meets after school at a junior high or high school. And you happen to be the lead trumpet player, and you got a really, really, really solid high D, really solid high D at home, and you go up to E flat, it's still decent, not as solid an E kind of thin out. So you're right around the D E flat range, and you are practicing two hours a day. You're trying to do everything right. But you notice that when you get into your big band rehearsal on Monday night or Tuesday night or Thursday night or whatever it is, that halfway through the rehearsal your chops are falling apart. You're missing these high D's and the high C's and you're getting the burn here. You just feel like you can't hold the note and your lips are blowing out and you're going out of tune. It's just not fun. I mean you're smashing your lips pretty good with the mouthpiece. And you keep scratching your head, what's going on? Because I'm practicing up an hour and a half or two hours a day, but I'm not able to have the endurance in my rehearsal. I'm cursed. There's some kind of hex that's put on me. No, my friend. When you go into a big, typical amateur to semi-pro big band rehearsal, uh, most of the high range is going to be up around high C and high D. Yeah, you might, you might find one chart that goes E or F, but basically, you know, you're going to be required to play quite a lot of high C's and D's. And if you're range at home is a high D or a high E flat, and let me just excuse myself for a second for other brass players, trombone players, euphonium, French horn, tuba, whatever, you just have to transpose whatever that is. This story that I'm telling is geared toward trumpet, but really it's geared toward everybody, but you would have to trans transpose the notes and yeah, make it your own story. So the problem with this particular individual, he is doing everything right practice-wise, probably is a really great player. His endurance is being um, inefficient in rehearsals and performances simply because he doesn't have the other part of the, the equation down. 
he needs to be having at least um, double F sharps and double G's pretty full and pretty decent at home. At least be able to hit a couple of them um, at home. Doesn't mean he has to play all day on those, but he has to be able to go up and reach those and, and tackle them pretty good a couple times in order to balance out this part of the equation. That's what most people are not getting. And in fact, it's actually, it's not that they're not getting it. I think most people just don't know. Every, t every time I talk to somebody about this, they don't really... Um, sync up the fact that your range has everything to do with your endurance. It really does. So I don't care if you practice four hours a day. If your range is D or E, you're just not going to be able to play D or E for three or four hours in a wedding reception. Big Ben. You know what I'm talking about? Your big man gets hired to do someone's wedding reception and they're going to have you play from 9 p.m. until 1 a.m. at night with, you know, you got four sets, 45 minutes. You're not going to last. Your age is high D and high E, and you're playing D's and E's in that particular um, wedding reception gig. You just are going to fall apart, and you're probably going to have to hit someone else, hit up somebody else in the section to cover some of your lead stuff. It's just not going to balance out that well. That well. Same thing if you're in a brass quintet. That's really really tough um, on your endurance and on your chops. And if you're playing, playing some of the easier brass quintet stuff where you just typically need to go up to F's and G's above the staff, which is really common in some of the easier stuff, or maybe even just high A right above the staff, and you have a high C, high D range, you're probably going to do okay on that, especially if you've been practicing the right amount. But if you're playing some of the tougher stuff, um, Empire Brass, Canadian Brass, that type of stuff, and which we're talking about stuff that goes you know, routinely high C's, D's, E's, and F's, Especially if you have to have your pick out, but even if you don't, I mean, you're still going to be required to high, lots of high C's and D's. Um, you're going to have all kinds of trouble in that particular group, simply because you don't have the range that's way above that. So this is a pretty important tutorial, for at least, at the very least, for you to have the light bulb turned on your head so you can go, wait a minute, I've been practicing three hours a day, but when I go into my band, I can't even play half of that. Well, it's because of the range thing. And so that's why I get some people say they're not interested in playing high notes and, you know, they want to play music. Well, here's the problem. If you don't develop your high range, I don't care what instrument, I don't care if you just play tuba. I mean, if you don't have any range, low and high range on your tuba, you're just going nowhere musically. And the same thing on the other brasses, French horn, euphonium, uh, cornet, trumpet, trombone, even slide bow, it doesn't really matter. If, if your range... It's not well above of what you have to play in your ensemble. You're just going to be out to lunch. You're going to be struggling. So I want to hear people say, I don't want to play high notes. I don't want to be that guy, you know, that's, that obnoxious screamer dude. Well, this is not about that. You can do what you want. Once you are able to play high, you can do what you want with it. Okay? If you have a great range, that means you don't have to scream out high notes and hang over and be that obnoxious high note player. What you can do is you can play comfortable, and easy in your ensembles and have plenty of endurance and that will make you feel just a million times better about playing because you know this is going to be pretty much rock solid. So let's go back to the original um, topic and question is endurance. What is endurance? Um, how can you improve your endurance? What are some things you can do to improve your endurance? Well, we already talked about the foundation of endurance. I didn't really describe what endurance is. So let's really talk about endurance. Endurance is the ability to do, to do a particular activity over and over and over for a period of time, usually a long period of time, and still be able to function quite well. So that's the definition of endurance. So let's just take, um, I was um, on a site talk, uh, reading about uh, marathoners, and obviously, I mean, this is a no-brainer, right? If you can run 26.2 miles, you got some hefty, hefty endurance, right? Your heart, your muscles, your legs, your energy, everything. Well, when I got into how some of these marathoners um, train, and this is a, these aren't just the professionals, just people in general who want to um, be able to run a marathon and have that endurance, do you think that they run 26 miles every day? And that's how they practice and train for a marathon? No, no, they don't. Um, they might get in 20 or 26 miles once a week, maybe, maybe once every 10 days, but they're getting close to it on the other days. They might be doing some 10, 15, and 20 mile runs, but what else are they doing? They're doing very, very, very fast sprints um, over a mile. They're doing very, very fast runs um, for 5K and 6K and 10K, or sorry, 5K and 10K runs. They're, they're doing those very, very fast. 
and then they're still trying to up their speed on, on their 15 mile or 20 mile runs. Why are they doing all that? Because they know that if they can have a faster running pace at these um, reduced miles or reduced distances, that's just going to help them that much more when they go for the marathon. And so let's think about that in terms of um, playing a brass instrument. The shorter durations, like the mile, the, the mile sprint that a marathoner might do, might be for, well, I'm speaking trumpet, but it could be for any brass instrument, might be that double G or that high F that you're hitting a couple times after you warm up and playing it really, really loud. That's like your mile sprint if you're a marathoner. And if you're doing that, good, you got the sprint. And then the, um, the other things would be, um, you know, like let's just say your 10K run, your six mile, you're going to really push, push the speed on that if you're a marathoner, right? Well, if you're playing a brass instrument, you're going to be doing some etudes and some um, other um, phrases that are going to be um, up around that high C, D, E flat range, okay? And you're going to be blowing those out pretty loudly, maybe even um, E or F. And so that's kind of how it translates into endurance on a brass instrument. Not, the bottom line is you can't just practice for three hours a day. That's like a marathon or trying to do a 26 mile run every day and thinking that they're that they're going to be able to run a 26 mile marathon. Fact is, even if they can do it at home under the stress and the pressure of a competition and a race, and what if they're not filling up the snuff and all they've ever done is run that 26 miles, they're going to have the same problem that any brass player would have in an ensemble or rehearsal and find themselves hitting a wall and gassing out maybe halfway through or maybe three quarters of the way. And so that strategy that I read about for marathoners is what I already know for this guy, for a brass instrument. Can't just practice three hours a day and expect to go in and play on your teeth at the range that your top range that you can play. You play a double G and you go play Buddy Rich for a rehearsal and Rob McConnell, Frank Mantooth, uh, Big Fat Band, Maynard Ferguson, Louis Belson, I mean, come on. You go play F's and double G's and you're not going to last and it's, you might end up hurting yourself or you're going to feel the hurt up here because you're going to be playing on the skin of your teeth. So endurance is the ability to do an activity or a period of time and do it successfully. And the way we build endurance on any brass instrument is to increase our range four to five notes above what you have to play in your rehearsal and your, and your performances. And then, of course, you also have the longevity of your practice to be pretty close to, um, you know, what you're expected to do in a rehearsal or performance. So let's talk about that real quick. If you're, if you're going to a Monday night big band rehearsal, for example, I'm saying that because now it's Monday night, and there actually happens to be a rehearsal big band next door to me. I'm over here at the college. So if their rehearsal goes from 7 to 9, which I think they said it does, 7 at 9, maybe 7 to 9.30, well... You need to be practicing, I would say, at least close to that on a daily on a daily basis, an hour and a half. An hour and a half to two hours a day would be perfect. Um, probably can get away with an hour and a half if you have a higher range, but somewhere around an hour and a half to two hours um, would be good. Now, if you don't do that, what you're going to do is you're going to come in, you're going to be like the weekend warrior. You're going to come in and you're going to go to the rehearsal and you're going to struggle and your chops are going to fall apart at the end and you're always going to hate to play the last couple of songs because you can't make it. And so if, if you don't mind that, well, that's a personal choice for you. But if you want to come in, sail through the rehearsal, and at the end of the rehearsal, uh, feel like you want to keep playing because you feel good and you're really in the groove, uh, then you actually have to, one, increase your range five steps above your playing range in that particular ensemble. Two, make sure that the, the longevity and the duration of your practice is pretty close to what you're expected to do when you go into the rehearsal or performance. And how do we increase, what are some, some ways to increase uh, your range and endurance? Well, I already made another video about that on YouTube. It's called the three most popular ways to, in, to increase your range. And those three, those three popular ways would be a good way for you to start if you don't have any other resources. Um, that would be flexibility studies, lip trills, lip slurs, glissandos. Um, any type of long, don long tone ende endeavor or routine. Long tones, anything from um, Maggio, Maggio stuff, stamp stuff, Gordon, and then also taking stuff up an octave. The reason you got to do that is because you have to get your your armature used to actually playing on you. I mean, you can't, you cannot not practice higher 
at home and expect to be able to go out there and do that in, in function in a rehearsal or performance. I mean, you actually have to, you know, play higher. And what I recommend for a lot of my students to, is to get something that they can actually play that's written high. And the reason for that is there's a psychological component. So if you're just always used to taking stuff up an octave and stuff that you might read, whether it could be the Arvin's book or maybe a jazz lick or whatever, uh, there is a psychological component that can intimidate you. And if you're not used to reading and seeing all the ledger lines about the staff, uh, even though you can play those notes and you've been practicing, there's a psychological component that destroys a lot of people when they go into a reading band or just a band in general and they got to play these notes. And you get intimidated by looking at all those ledger lines. Those notes look higher than they really are. That just scares you. You see three dashes and then the, the, uh, you know, the note sitting on that third dash with the staff. That's an E, you know, high E for trumpet. A lot, that might scare a lot of people, you know, seeing that. And when you can already do that at home, but you've been taking up an octave. So uh, my suggestion for increasing your endurance would be to make sure that the, let's just recap this um, lesson right now, just to make sure that your practice, your daily practice is pretty close. It doesn't have to always be exact, but it's coming in pretty close to what you're expected to do in your rehearsal. If you have a two hour rehearsal, for example, at least get in, you know, an hour and a half a day of practice. Um, that's the number one thing that you got to make sure that you're doing. And the number two, the other part of the equation, that these are both equal, is you have to do things to increase your range four or five notes above what you're seeing in your rehearsal. And I just told you what to do. What were they? Lip flexibility, lip trill, glissandas, lip slurs, long tones, including pedal tones, and then um, playing stuff high or up an octave. And then the, the part B of that is to actually get some stuff written above the staff so you're not intimidated psychologically and when you see those notes way above the staff. So I hope this really helped. I mean, this is um, some very, very good advice for you. It really is. If you just start doing this, you are going to be tickled that you notice you can play higher and better and you last longer in your rehearsals. And it doesn't have to be just about jazz. This could be orchestral, symphonic, like I already mentioned, um, brass quintet, um, chamber. It really is all about, um, you know, the duration of your particular ensemble and not so much about the idiom or the style. Same thing, if you got your, your, the metal on your mouth for two hours in a symphony rehearsal, um, it might be a little bit easier because we know brass players a lot of times, you know, we have to count like a hundred measures of rest, so there is a little bit of an easier component there when you're playing orchestral stuff compared to other stuff. But you get the gist of this. Um, in, in lesson on endurance. Remember, there's two parts of it, and you can't just have one without the other. If you do, it's going to be like this. Crash and burn, baby. You don't want that. Kurt Thompson, hope you really enjoyed this. Found it informative, and don't just watch it and go on to something else. Make notes and actually start doing it. Isometrics. Everybody loves them, all brass players. Because you really think that you're going to get quick and easy strength right away. And actually, for the most part, it's true. So I demonstrated the Bud, Briz, Bud Brisboy tuba mouthpiece exercise. And that's a toughie. Just hold it with my lips. I did the pencil trick on steroids. This is a wooden spoon and it's much, much longer and heavier than a pencil. And then our friend, the Pete, personal armature training exerciser from Warburton. And there's a lot of other um, isometrics that you can do. So for you people who are relying on these isometrics to take up the slack in your practice because you're not always, always able to practice as much as you'd want or you got plenty of time to practice but you're doing these to supercharge and get your 
chops on steroids almost. Um, when it comes to the trumpet embouchure and actually the other brass embouchures out there, and then here's the problem. Here's the real problem. Okay, so these and other things that you can do will increase your strength. In fact, they'll do so dramatically. If that's the case, then why not just do a handful of these and leave everything else by the wayside? And how come everybody can't play as high as they want to? You know, so what's up? Here's the problem. If you don't do these in just the right away and for a right amount of duration, what happens is you lose the flexibility here in your lips. And in some cases, your, your lips can get numbed out to where they don't even vibrate that well. So you gain the strength. You feel it. You feel the strength here. Lots of muscle, right? So why isn't it working for everybody? The reason it's not working for everybody is this. You're catching a case of lip stiffitis. Lip stiffitis. Ever got a cramp from working out too much or running or biking or whatever? You know? Well, the same thing happens here, but at a slightly different level. And by doing too much isometrics, you're going to increase the brittleness the stiffness and unfortunately suffer quite a loss of flexibility. You say, so what? I got strong chops, baby. I'm going to blow right through that. Au contraire, my friend. So yes, you did build up some strong armature from these isometrics, right? But remember, trumpet playing and, well, let's just face, let's name the other instruments. Um, trombone playing, euphonium playing, baritone playing, French horn playing, tuba playing. Whenever you get into the upper register of each instrument, it's about efficiency, isn't it? It really is about efficiency. So here's what, here's the problem with practicing these isometrics. And by the way, they are in my course and I do teach them. But here's the problem. Most people don't understand um, the concentrated part of isometrics. So you end up building the strength but your range doesn't really go up that much. Your tone gets airy. You start having trouble with just simple lip flexibilities, simple normal slurs that you encounter in regular music. And so you've lost flexibility. You've got a good case of stiffitis in your lips. And so why can't you blow out those high notes? Why can't you last forever? You know, a lot of um, people that are really heavily involved in isometrics will tell you that it's a panacea for all day endurance. Um, one of the methods out there that I that I went through a long time ago is Carmine Caruso. And it, I haven't even touched on that method in a long time, but uh, it is heavily weighted for, for um, isometrics. So how come everybody's not doing Carmine Caruso? The reason that they're not is because uh, what you gain on one scale, you lose on the other. So you get heavy chops, yes. Unfortunately, you lose the flexibility, stiff, and guess what? You end up tilting it the opposite direction you want to go and you get worse. Why do you get worse? Because when you get ready to blow, think of it this way. You want the best flexibility and the best response. And let's see if I got any response after doing those exercises. Just easy, right? And even after doing that, I can tell my tone got just a touch airy. So there's positive proof right there. Don't do too much of these. So, but no, it's basically because I didn't warm up and I started doing these. This, so I have an excuse. Okay. Um, it's about efficiency. So, and response. So if you build this up and can't get your lips to vibrate soon enough, easy enough, and be very flexible, what happens is you're spending a lot of your energy and a lot of your chops forcing, almost forcing those lips to vibrate. They're blowing, you have to blow a little harder, you have to maybe use a little bit more mouth pre mouthpiece pressure. The end result is counterintuitive because you just built up strength, you can feel it. You can really feel when you got good chops, you know. You can actually start to see the muscles pop out 
and I'm not a skinny guy. You know? So I got some meat on my bones, but you can still see the muscles popping out when you got chops. So when you got the chops, you feel it, but if you can't get the notes to come out, or your sound is airy, really airy, and you can't do octave skips anymore, and you can't slur, and can't lip trill, you should know that you got a serious case of stiffitis, and it's likely come from doing too much isometric. So that's the problem. We all want a nice little shortcut, right? Do this, and the, and the peat, and where's my pencil on steroids right here? It's your old grandmother's wooden spoon, isn't it? Look at that. It's uh, You'll find that that's not uh, a walk in the park to do that one either. So we always want something that will just get us to where we need to go quicker and easier. And the problem with isometrics, you just really got to know what you're doing. And I've actually been around the block on isometrics and done everything the wrong way. Done everything so-so. And then I got this stuff down to a science of exactly what you need to do and when. The sets, the reps, and the rest. So... If you don't know that, you're going to be doing what I was doing years ago, hitting and missing. And if you do it the wrong way, you might find yourself not being able to play, you know, for a good week or two. If for some reason you're you you are raising your hand guilty, and you're having trouble playing, you're having trouble with the air in your tone, you can't slur that well, you can't hardly do any shakes, your endurance has gone out the window, you feel like you're playing right on your teeth all the time. It might be because of the isometrics, if you are doing the isometrics. And um, if you and I never actually speak in person, I would just tell you this. You know, you're going to have to bite the bullet and quit playing for a week, maybe up to two weeks, and start back and gradually kind of get in the groove. Don't do any isometrics. Um, I know that you don't really want to hear that, but if you are in this position and we don't talk, you have to understand that you got to quit playing for a week and maybe up to two weeks and start back all over. It's a process and it does require someone, um, you know, a teacher to help you go through it if you wanted to be able to do it correctly. So anyway, there you got it. You got your answer. You're looking at all these isometrics and you're seeing maybe even some celebrity players playing, right? And you're going, dang, they can play that good. Uh, maybe I should get it and start doing it, but you start getting worse. And that's the reason. You got the chops. You've lost the flexibility and you're just blowing hard and you're being inefficient and all of a sudden your endurance goes out the window. You don't got any range because you burn everything up. You know, it's just like those um, those hot rods, you know, that, that go a quarter mile and 300 miles an hour, you know, but they're not going to go for a thousand miles. They're, they, they blew their wad after a quarter mile and that's what you're doing. You're blowing it all up and you're done. So take my advice. This, I think, was a very valuable trumpet lesson and I consider it a brass lesson for everybody else. Do the isometrics and you do it too much in the wrong way without the proper guidance and not only will you gain not gain range and endurance you might actually find yourself worse than before you ever started. So Kurt Thompson hope you enjoyed this trumpet lesson about the, the amateur or trumpet amateur brass amateur and the isometrics that we can do that we carefully have to be involved with and I hope that maybe you might consider hit me up it's my job it's my job to help you get better if you can recognize that then give me a shout at Kurt at trumpetsizzle.com cheers hey did you just get braces on and now you're a freshman in the marching band or maybe you're the junior in the marching band and you play trumpet, uh, French horn or trombone. You know, those, uh, especially the trombone, that's a little bit easier if you got braces. French horn is even harder. But French horn, you're typically not trying to get up into the, you know, the um, loud crashing waves of sound that um, the whole marching band trumpet section might have to do. So, is there a way to to get yourself back to where you were, maybe even better, without crushing your lips into those barbed wires of your braces on your teeth. Yes, there is. For many, many years now, uh, more than a decade, um, I've been using this one awesome 
technique. I guess it's a little known technique because I don't hear about other people doing it. Extensive practice in the tier 2 range of pedal tones. Using your tongue arch like you would if you were playing above the staff. So it's, I guess it's not common knowledge. If you want to get back to where you were, trumpet guy or trumpet gal, and you got raises, and you're trying to just get back to where you were, or maybe even get better, but it's feeling horrible right now and painful, and you're, let's just say you, you can barely play an F on the staff, you know, that's going to really, you know, that's really going to suck, I mean, to go through the school year like that. So, you practice this, and I guarantee that you'll be able to get either close to where you were, or maybe even a little bit better than where you were. And the reason is practice, practicing extensively in the tier 2 range of pedal tones is like practicing a high C to double G, almost. Except you're not going to crush your lips against the barbs in the braces in your mouth. So, uh, first things first, you should already have an understanding of pedal tones, or at least if you don't understand what they are, you might want to search some of my other tutorials. Maybe I'll include a link of... Um, um, some pedal tones, you know, that we've done. If I find that I haven't actually included that on my YouTube channel, I'll probably include a, just a course, uh, you know, very brief over overview of it. But pedal tone basically starts below F sharp. Our lowest note, our natural acoustical note on the trumpet is F sharp. If you try to go below that without manipulating your amateur, can't go below that note unless you do something with your lips, your air, your tongue. And that's what we're doing with pedal tones. Pedal tone is manipulation of those things I just mentioned. So tier two pedal tone notes. This is the heavy duty, heavyweight contender of the pedal tones. It is the most difficult. So this is not a walk in the park. The technique I'm telling you is actually somewhat advanced. You'd be better off to be working with somebody like me or another specialist in range and endurance um, taking you through this, but this is just to get you started, or let's just say you don't have the extra cha-ching right now um, to have one of us brass coaches work with you. At least you can be doing something on your own and making some kind of progress. So here it is. To increase, to still be able to increase your range on your trumpet, even though you got braces, you're going to be practicing the notes in the tier two range. What are those notes? Pedal C. And the easy way to do it is just to do octave tester notes. You would play the normal low C on the horn, open, down an octave. That's pedal C. B, natural, to pedal B. B flat, low B flat down to pedal B flat. A low A down to pedal A. Low A flat down to pedal A flat. Low G down to pedal G, and you must play it one and three both ways, folks. Don't cheat. 1 and 3 for the low G and 1 and 3 for the pedal G only. And finally the last pedal tone in the tier 2 uh, range of pedal tones is the G flat or F sharp. So here's the low F sharp G flat. Drop it an octave. So those are the notes in the tier two pedal range, uh, pedal C, pedal B, pedal B flat, pedal A, pedal A flat, pedal G, and pedal G flat or F sharp. And you got to figure the low pedal G as one and three, the pedal G flat F sharp as all of them down only for those last two. Okay, let's see. So your job right now, if you don't have a lot of experience with pedal tones, is to go ahead and go out to the woodshed and start working on these and it's not going to be easy. 
Think about it. You're actually playing in a range that's, that's very similar to this range up here. So I just play the notes in upper register on trumpet. High C, high D, high E, high F, and double G. Those are what most would agree on are considered upper register. Um, if you go above the double G, then you get into at least what I call extreme, extreme upper register. So when you're practicing in the tier two of pedal tones, amazingly enough, it's just almost as if you're practicing and killing yourself Right? Now, if you were doing that with braces, you might be going, oh, my Lord. Oh, you might start crying because it's going to be painful. It's really going to hurt. But with uh, my technique and the trumpet exercise I just gave you for practicing tier two pedal tones, it is a life-saving moment because you can really still continue to increase the embouchure, the strength, and even some of the compression. You won't be hurting your lips hardly at all in the tier two range of pedal tones. Now, there are some other tips and tricks to enable the tier two pedal tones to come out, and that's where people like myself or other people that might have an expertise in range and endurance can help you out. But at least right now, if you want to do it on your own, you at least got something that's going to help increase your range and endurance on the trumpet, even though you got braces. See you the next one. I'm Kurt Thompson. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. Hey, this will be a discussion about brass embouchure and the differences in embouchure and how even if you think you might have a bad embouchure it can be overcome by strengthening your embouchure from all different kinds of directions and I'm going to play some embouchures that um, are bad for me and that typically for me I would not be able to play very well using these type of embouchures. Now one thing to keep in mind no one embouchure is really bad for an individual and so what that really means is what might be bad for me and I sound horrible on might be really good for you. And so it depends on, if you look carefully, your lips, how long they are, how short they are, how narrow they are, how thick they are, how thin they are, your teeth, how much of an overbite you have, how much of an underbite you have, um, if they're crooked, if you're wearing braces, so if maybe you have... Um, a partial denture so it can include a lot of different things and also your just your bone and jaw structure that's why I think that um, some brass coaches and teachers can do more harm to a student by forcing them into a particular embouchure um, for example the most common would be centered and a little bit more on the top lip that seems to be you know the most common but not everybody is going to do well with that particular embouchure. 
Um, the other thing that you should be aware of is that if you attempt to drastically change your embouchure, it seems like in my experience and opinion, people that have done that end up really not faring any better. In fact, a lot of people get worse. So if you think a big drastic embouchure change is the answer, you're probably barking up the wrong tree. So let's look at some various embouchures. Um, here we can see. For me, I tend to play a little, a little higher. So I guess you got your um, high high player or high lip placement uh, position. You got your medium or middle and your low. So those, those would be the different um, placements. So high would be, it's probably high. Now I can go higher, but. That's probably close to where I normally would play. Now, what happens if I wasn't playing that way and I was using a, you know, an embouchure that was bad for me? Um, let's try something. Let's drop it way down. So I'm up here. Let's go on way down. Way down. Hear the difference in tone quality? But guess what? I'm still able to get the high C. I'm still able to play, but it doesn't sound that good. But I can still do it. Um, let's go maybe um, medium. So normally I play here. Let's go down just a little bit. Seemed like it noticeably flat on the high C. I think I was flat on the first one too. But so I'm still able to play. Now I'm gonna I'm going to be tying this all into a huge point here. Um, okay, so now let's talk about angles. So I can use my normal armature here. What if I bringled it up? Because I see people playing like this. Okay, it had a significant high angle to it. One of the most interesting um, armatures I've ever seen is uh, by Stan Mark, the famous lead trumpet player for Maynard Ferguson. I don't know how he can play the way he does. Um, take a look at it. It's like he puts the trumpet up straight, and then he comes up to <laughs> he comes up to the mouthpiece. You really got to watch him do it when he's playing live. It's he. Um, it's very interesting. He's got the trumpet here, and then he'll come up. So the trumpet's actually straight out, but he's coming up at this angle. So, <laughs> now the, most of the embouchures that I'm showing you are ones that I really couldn't play on. In fact, if I was playing on them, I might be just like you are right now. If you have a particular question about your embouchure and that it's not working for you, well, if my trumpet teacher long ago had said you need to play like this, like Stan Mark, so I've got the horn out, I'm coming into it like this. Well... I mean, if I was using that amateur all along, thinking that, that that was how it was supposed to be, um, I would be having a lot of trouble, and I would be wanting to look at a video like this to change my amateur or do something about it. So, um, okay, so now we got, we had, we had the upper angle like that. We had, did we do this one yet? Well, I think that's kind of like, more like Stan Marks, isn't it? Yeah, it's more, it's more of a, he's coming into it like that, but you can still go downwards. Okay, now um, what if you don't play center? A lot of us brass teachers want you know, kids to be centered right smack dab in the middle of their lips. Unfortunately, our jaw structure and teeth and everything else might suggest otherwise. So um, here's me, I'm, I'm center now. I'm a little bit off center, I guess. Um, it's kind of difficult to do this too um, while I'm playing, but I wanted to get the camera up close, and so I needed to be holding the camera. Okay, so here, here's kind of where I normally play. What if I didn't play centered? I played off. I can still.
they'll get it. It's a little bit crackly. What if I go way over? What if I'm crazy and I go way over here? And that's a real screwed up homager, isn't it? Uh, okay, let me try playing the horn left-handed here and hold the camera this other way. So, go back to center. Or center for me. Let's move it over to the left a little bit. Let's just say I played a little bit off. Okay? That's kind of wacky, isn't it? But some people play in all these different positions. Now, no, I've never seen anybody really play out here. But um, what if we go over here? I'm, I'm going to go crazy. Look at that. All right. So you saw various positions from high to medium to low. Mouthpiece placement. And, of course, each one of those takes a different embouchure um, to be able to play, right? Um, you saw me go over a little off-center. The way off center, back to center, off center this way, and way off. And then you saw the horn angles, horn angles like this, and then down. So I basically covered uh, just about any embouchure that a brass player could play with. Now, the point I'm trying to make in all of this is that there's one reason that I could go up to high C on all those angles, all those embouchures. Now, granted, you notice that the tone quality went way out the window on a lot of them. And obviously, that would mean that I wouldn't use that particular embouchure, right? But how am I able to do that? And if I wanted to, folks, I can switch my embouchure to any embouchure and um, start to get comfortable and familiar with it and uh, let it sink in. It takes me about a week. And I'm able to do all that because of an extreme amount of strength that I build up in the embouchure and the lips. So what is my real point to you brass players out there that are micromanaging yourself, that are being um, confused by too much worry and thinking? Um, what's that um, analysis by paralysis kind of thing? Overanalyzing everything. So my advice to you is, number one, you need to do something that will hit your embouchure from so many different directions that it almost won't even matter what embouchure that you use. I mean, you want to use the embouchure where you feel most comfortable, where you get the best sound, the best tone, and things just feel right. You don't want to use the embouchure that a teacher tells you to use and it feels horrible it always seems bad. You, it seems like you're always struggling. Of course, you don't have any high range and your endurance is shot. But supposedly, quote unquote, that's the place where you should put it. Um, ideally, I like to have my students, my younger ones, start off with um, centered on the lips and slightly a little higher on your top lip. But it, sometimes that doesn't work for them, you know, depending on what I see going on with them and um, you know their their teeth structure and other things in their lips sometimes we have to bring it back right down to the center and sometimes even go down a little bit lower sometimes the upstream the player um, will not be an upstream player until um, he or she or their teacher figures that out so if a student is not doing too well with the typical embouchure that I like to get them started on well I'll start playing with it we might move their mouthpiece down and have more of the lower lip inside the cup. And if they do a lot better with that, then hey, why not? That's them. Why not let them do that? So you need to strengthen your chops, your embouchure, and your lips in many different directions. So what did we learn? We learned that not one particular embouchure is suited for everybody. And you may find that playing on embouchure that supposedly does not look good to other players but works for you that may be the embouchure that you need to be using you got to play where it's comfortable where you're sounding good and if you're a little bit off center and if the horn angle like for Stan Mark look you got to google him and watch him play I mean he's got an extreme angle that he's coming at um, I don't know how he does it but it, it works for him 
And there's other people that play with the horn at an extreme up angle. And then there's people that play off the side of their the center of their lips. So you got to find the sweet spot for you, not the sweet spot that your teacher thinks is for you. Um, if the teacher thinks of a great embouchure position for you when you were younger and it worked, by all means, that teacher gave you great advice. If the teacher kept forcing you to stay in with a particular setup, but you are not doing that well, uh, that's when you start. You really need to start thinking um, differently, and maybe there might be a different setup uh, for people. In fact, I want to thank Sharon for um, giving me an idea about this particular video. Um, so for people who are concerned about bad embouchures and good embouchures, more mouthpiece pressure, less mouthpiece pressure, I really don't want you to be thinking about that if you're working with me and you're taking lessons from me or you're taking my course. What I want you to be doing is focusing on the 75 techniques, if you're involved in my course, that are going to hit this from so many different angles. In fact, now is a perfect time to plug my course, which you know I almost do in all, almost all my videos. Um, your embouchure and the muscles here in your lips need to be worked in so many different directions. And you know what that really does is it makes worrying about embouchure and everything else, angles and where your mouthpiece is um, hitting your lips, too high, too low, in the middle, off center, almost irrelevant because once you develop chops of steel, um, you can play, pretty much play anywhere that you wanted. I, did, I demonstrated that, right? I mean, I took the angles all over my mouth, and I was still able to get up to high C. You just probably heard a change in tone quality from either decent to, to bad. But still, I was able to do it, mainly because of this. So, you need if you're concerned about your embouchure, lack of strength, um, or maybe you're using a bad embouchure, you're using excessive pressure, there's really only one answer, and you're going to have to come to the conclusion quickly by deferring to someone that knows what they're doing and has worked with a lot of people that would be like me or somebody else in my capacity. Or you can kind of go to the school of hard knocks and keep pounding away at the one method that you're using. Maybe you're not even using a method. Maybe you're just practicing all technique, Clark and Arbins and other stuff and some warm-ups. Or maybe you are involved in a routine. Claude Gordon. Only doing Claude Gordon. Or only doing the palming method with William Costello and Roy Stevens. Or only doing the um, isometric stuff of Carmine Crusoe. So if you're pounding away at one routine and you don't want to change, yet you have amateur problems, endurance problems, range problems, excessive mouthpiece pressure problems, and it doesn't matter if you're on trumpet or trombone or euphonium or French horn or any brass instrument, the mechanics and the approach is still the same basically. Well, you're going to find out through the school of hard knocks if you keep insisting on working that one routine for your embouchure development, you're going to find out it doesn't work. It only takes you to a certain amount and you get stuck. So my advice is to go back and rewind this video and watch it again and think to yourself, how is he able to put that mouthpiece in all these wacky positions on his lip, up and down and all around, yet still be able to get a high C out on each one? If the answer comes to you that maybe I might have stumbled onto something that's very successful when it comes to embouchure development, then you really need to look in the item description below this video and go to my homepage, trumpetsizzle.com. And I'm mainly addressing people that have embouchure problems, that have problems with too much mouthpiece pressure, that um, maybe play off to the side or too high or too low, or, or maybe need to experiment. The um, 75 techniques in my course almost is an auto correction mechanism for minor embouchure problems. In other words, it's hard to go through all 75 techniques and get those down after four months and not have had some kind of shift in your embouchure. Your embouchure and your mouthpiece placement will shift during the four months. For some, slightly, and for some, noticeably, because you'll need to be able to accommodate those various techniques. And you just can't go through 75 different techniques in four months and not have a change take place here. You're going to have the musculature thicken and develop, but you're also going to have a change take place in the embouchure. So 
Um, if you don't recognize me by my lips, I'm Kurt Thompson. You may have thought this was somebody else the whole time, but I am Kurt Thompson, and I wanted you to get a close-up of my jaw, my lips, and um, hopefully got close enough, close enough on those different embouchures. So don't let embouchure scare you or wear you down. You focus instead on building embouchure strength from all kinds of angles and from from my point of view, 75 techniques with the different angles that, that we're going to hit you at in your embouchure is just the holy grail to upper register and endurance improvement. Well, now that you got to know my lips really good and my embouchure, I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. So, that was a test of your pedal tone ability. I started on first bass F, and I worked my way down with a F major concert E flat scale all the way down to triple pedal F. Now, that's a test of your overall ability to do pedal tones, but keep in mind, um, each tier of pedal tones has a different characteristic in it and a different um, level of difficulty. So briefly, um, your bread and butter and your meat and potatoes um, pedal tone tier is the second tier, it's the most hardest tier of all. In fact, for those of you who are um, not really um, it, uh, playing up into the upper register, I mean ability to do it, we're, start, we're talking about starting at high C up to about double G, give or take. Um, that range right there is the upper register. Above that is the extreme upper register. So, um, if you're trying a lot of different things, um, uh, at least check your pedal tones. Um, if you can't do what I just did, um, that may be one place to start looking and start practicing on. Now, um, to be efficient and focused with your time, when it comes to um, gaining strength in your embouchure and a big round sound, especially in all registers, you really want to pay attention to the second tier. So the second, the second tier is the hardest of all pedal tones to play. That starts with pedal C. And I'll just play it down. The best way to do it is just to do octaves, unless you have perfect pitch, uh, it's, which I don't. I got relative perfect pitch, but if you don't have perfect pitch, just go ahead and play the tester note an octave higher. So here's the low C. And then the pedal C. B. B flat A A flat G Now notice I'm going to play G 1 and 3 Don't cheat and play it open And then the last one in the second tier of the pedal tones the, um, This is the hardest um, tier of pedal tones Would be the G flat or F sharp again When you go down to play it don't cheat and play second valve for the, the pedal. Go ahead and leave it as one, two, and three. Here's the low G flat. Okay, so that's the hardest range. Um, now, the way, let me just describe the different levels of t uh, pedal tones. The first here is from F to D flat. E. E flat. D. Then D flat. Okay, so um, you'll probably be able to get most of those. That's what I consider like a medium difficult level of uh, pedal tones. So the first tier of pedal tones, um, which I just did, is the medium level of difficulty uh, for pedal tones. That's F, pedal F down to pedal D flat. And you already heard me do the most difficult level of pedal tones which I consider your meat and potatoes. Uh, that's where you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck as far as your practice time 
especially if you're shooting for um, upper register and power. You're going to get it from the second tier, which is the most hardest. That's pedal C all the way down to pedal G flat. Don't cheat when you get down to pedal G and pedal G flat by playing those open and two. Make sure you play pedal G one and three and play pedal G flat one, two, and three. Hey, I'm Kurt Thompson here to talk to you about the three known ways that most trumpet teachers and brass teachers would tell you how to increase your range. And in some videos, you may have heard me kind of disrespect these a little bit, and that would only be because you've tried these three ways, yet you keep trying these three ways to um, really bring out the most amount of range. The three ways I'm going to talk about are the main themes and concepts behind uh, your beginning uh, range building and endurance increases and improvements and this is what you're going to probably hear when you go to most instructors or private lessons and maybe even on the internet forums so uh, they will this will get you actually a little bit of a ways if you don't have any range at all or any endurance you at least be making sure you're doing these and that's why I'm giving these away for free because it's it's something that you at least have to start at this point uh, it will only take you so far so once you use these um, techniques and only get to a certain level and you can't really seem to get beyond that, that's when you have to come to me in my course, the 16 week upper register course, and add another three or four notes to your range. But this will get you a little bit of a jump start and might as well uh, do it if you haven't been doing it. A lot of you watching this video will have already undoubtedly heard about these and have already been doing it. And then you're watching this to see if you can increase your range past that, but this won't help you. So you do these three until you reach a certain level where you plateau off and you're not going to be able to break that barrier you're going to have to do something different and um, in this particular case doing something different I'll put my website address would be taking a momentum based course to really supercharge your range and endurance but anyway let's get to these um, these three um, known mainstream techniques number one long tones you go to any trumpet teacher around the world any college university you ask about playing um, playing and increasing your range, you're going to tell you long tones. It can be in the form of pedal tones. F, pedal F. Or the harder range would be tier two, would be your like your pedal C's. C. So any kind of long tone, even in the reg in regular lower middle register. chromatically there you can go up so long tones there's just too many to even list here but I just gave you some examples tone long tones will help out your range and endurance also a good tone comes from practicing tone studies and flow studies remember tone a gorgeous big beautiful brassy tone that you can almost just reach out and grab you just kind of get that feeling and when you hear someone play with a great tone that comes from tone so you want better tone it comes from tone long tones all right, let's move on to the second one. So the first one was um, long tones, and you can include pedal tones, and it's just a whole myriad of ways to do long tones. But you got to be making sure that you incorporate some kind of long tone um, study in your practice. As far as how much to do it and what to do, that's where people like us come in handy because we need to hear you play and get a feel for where you're at, and then we could better um, prescribe the right long tone study for you. Second thing would be lip flexibility studies. And lip flexibilities are broken down into three parts. Glissandos, lip trills, and regular lip slurs. So you need to have that incorporated into your practice as well if you're trying to increase your range of endurance. Um, obviously lip trills would be a very fast oscillation between two notes. G, start on G with a staff. Or it could be lower if your range is then high. Let's do a C. C to E.
and that's an example of lip curl. Of course, there's a lot of different books out there that have all kinds of interesting exercises um, to do your lip curls on. My favorite right now, well, I got, well, yeah, my favorite right now is Dr. Charles Colon Advanced Lip Flexibilities for Trump. It's a big red book with white lettering. I swear by that book. I love that one. So there you have it. So um, lip curls. The second part of um, lip flexibilities would be your glissando. In fact, I remember. I'm reading Roger Ingram's book and if my memory serves me correctly he really swore by practicing one octave glissandos that's I think that's his claim um, to range fame if I remember what he said in his book I don't quote me perfectly but because I, I read it a long time ago but he really swore by um, one octave glissandos so and you're probably gonna want to do them where at least reach you reach out of the staff like a Or even high C. And then you can start adding octaves. And then you could expand it to, um, well, if you wanted to go to like three octaves. Low A. So that's your glissandos. The third and final way, uh, as far as lip flexibility is, is concerned, just basic, basic, basic lip slurs, easy for me to say. So you get it around the horn and you're trying to be clean and precise with your lip slurs. Something as simple as this. Or even simpler. the idea lip slurs okay so so far we discussed long tones in their various formats lip flexibilities which are broken down into three parts there's only three ways that you can get around on this horn without using these and without using that and that would be the glissando that we just talked about um, lip trills and lip flexibilities or lip slurs actually lip slurs would be part of the lip flexibilities and now the third way that most trumpet teachers would tell you or advise you on how to be able to increase your range would be able to take something up an octave. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, if you're more of a beginning or intermediate student, probably intermediate, or you simply just don't have that good of a range and you're hanging around G's above the staff and you're still a good fourth away from even be the beginning upper register, which starts at IC, I would at least have you work on um, scales and arpeggios up an octave. If you're used to practicing the C scale, and you're kind of staying around that range, you want to start giving it a go an octave higher, even if you have to go slower. Or arpeggios. If you're used to being in that range, try to see if you can squeeze it out an octave higher. Those are some examples there. Of course, you don't have to just stay on the C major. We're talking about anything from a chromatic. Chromatics, arpeggio, scales, you name it. And then you can finally go to little tunes. Um, they could be uh, classical little things out of the Arvins, um, jazzy ones. Um, anything that you've ever played, you could try to take it up an octave. Um, something simple like this. Take it up an octave. Okay, that was Sesame Street. So I'm just doing this off the cuff. You know, I don't have any, I didn't have any um, set list that I'm going off for this particular video tutorial but anyway this is gold if you haven't already been doing this and you want to skyrocket your range and your endurance this is a no-brainer folks you got to be doing at least the three things that trumpet teachers around the world would tell you to do even if they really can't play that high in the upper register or they don't specialize they're going to tell you these three things what were they again 
long tones in all their various forms. Number two, lip flexibilities. And there's only three ways we can get around the horn um, lip flexibility wise. Lip trills, right? Glissandos, and lipsers. And finally, the third thing is to start just getting the courage and being confident and take some stuff up an octave. It could be um, your band part in eighth grade band if you're an eighth grader. It could be some little licks um, that you've learned. It could be scales, chromatics. Just start with the idea like, hey, let me just see if I can take this up an octave. So, I'm Kurt Thompson. My site is www.trumpetsizzle.com. You can email me at kurt at trumpetsizzle.com. Now, you're going to use these techniques, and they're going to take you a little bit of the way up. But you're going to find at some point you get stuck. Everybody gets stuck, and that's why they come to me or um, other people that um, teach and kind of focus on the, the power side of the horn, the physical part, um, the volume, the tone, the sound, the range, the endurance. So um, anyway, I hope that you got a little something out of this. And if you already knew this, great, it was a review. And then go get my course, come on. You want to get another four or five notes? I know you do, right? Bye-bye.